sergeants, I'm going to begin the live stream and I just want to confirm that you will be able to see it on the council website. Good morning at this time. Will all sergeants please start the recordings? Recording to the computer, all set. Recording to the cloud, ready to go. Sergeant Sadowski, please read your opening. Yes. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Education, jointly with the Committee on General Welfare. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, chairs. We are ready to begin. Okay, uh, good morning. To everyone on today's Zoom, uh, for the Committee of Education and Committee on General Welfare, a joint hearing uh, on youth and shelter and the school system. My name is Mark Traeger, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Education. I am joined by my colleague, uh, Chair General Welfare, Steve, Stephen Levin, uh, whom we will hear from shortly. I want to thank the Department of Education and the Department of Homeless Services for being here today to provide testimony and answer council member questions on this topic. Students experiencing homelessness and living in temporary housing attend schools in every single district in the city. Citywide, there's over 100,000 students, um, a significant portion of our student population. Uh, prior to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, homeless children and youth already faced many obstacles that hinder them from achieving their full potential. COVID-19 has exacerbated those obstacles and added new ones. Some of the additional challenges posed by this pandemic include uh, a lack of appropriate educational spaces within shelters, problems obtaining an internet enabled device to engage in remote learning and unreliable or no access to Wi-Fi. Uh, these issues and so many more are acutely felt by homeless students. Homeless students have the same educational rights as anyone else, and we as a city must ensure that we are meeting their social, emotional, academic needs. This hearing will allow us to hear from the administration um, on efforts to bring Wi-Fi to all shelters in the city, ensuring that every student that needs a device has one, that we have appropriate levels of support, staffing in shelters, um, that we have planned appropriate educational supports, for the upcoming summer in so many areas that are needed to be addressed. The committee in education has been singularly focused since the onset of, of the remote council hearings to ensuring that the topics we cover shine a light on the greatest disparities in our current educational environment. As we have highlighted, in the best of times, we as a city and school system were lacking in many facets of providing a free and appropriate education to every single student in New York City public school system. COVID-19 has brought new obstacles, ex exacerbated obstacles and challenges. Uh, we have highlighted the successes of the DOE throughout this pandemic, but we have also highlighted where the DOE and the mayor must do better. Chancellor Ross Porter, who testified at our preliminary budget hearing last month, has brought a zeal to the job as a former teacher, principal, superintendent, and executive superintendent seeing firsthand the many daily challenges being faced by our students and their educators. 
In today's hearing, I look forward to concrete plans and actual answers to our questions on how the administration is handling the issues facing homeless youth. This committee will also hear uh, intro 139 sponsored by Chair Levin, a local law requiring the DOE to report on student health services in correlation with student housing status for students in K-8. Uh, before turning to Chair Levin for his opening remarks, I wanna thank committee staff, uh, Malcolm, Kalima, Jan, Chelsea, uh, Mesis, and Frank. I also wanna thank my own staff, Anna, Vanessa, Maria, and Janine for preparing for today's hearing. And I will now turn it over to my colleague, Chair Levin. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Traeger. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's hearing on youth in shelter and the school system. My name is Stephen Levin. I'm chair of the Committee on General Welfare here in the Council, and I am proud to co-chair this hearing with my colleague, Councilmember Mark Traeger, chair of the Community on Education. Um, approximately one in 10 New York City public school students are experiencing homelessness. The trend has unfortunately remained steady over the last several years. Advocates have argued that the pandemic has likely caused this number to rise since school staff have had less of an ability to witness changes to a student's housing status. The city's shelter system is intended to be temporary. Yet we know that the average length of stay of student in shelter has increased to a ridiculous 495 days. 495 days is the average length of stay in shelter for a child. That's an increase of 12.5% for families with children for the first in the first four months of fiscal 21 as compared to the first four months of fiscal 2020. And that number has been increasing steadily for the last 10 years. Students experiencing homelessness were already at a disadvantage before the pandemic and the disparities that they encounter have only been exacerbated. Today, in addition to it examining the oversight topic, we are hearing two bills that have introduced to address some of these disparities. Intro 150 would create a task force to address the transportation of homeless students. Many students who live in temporary housing have to commute across the city to get to their schools. These students are legally entitled to transportation to their school of origin. According to advocates, it took nearly six months since the beginning of the pandemic for the city to finalize busing routes for homeless students, despite the fact that they have a right to transportation. Moreover, as the city shifted to remote learning during the pandemic, the average school attendance rate declined to 71.4% compared to 86.7% during the same period of last year for children in the DHS shelter system. Uh, and an article just came out yesterday showing the disparity between the attendance rates for students in shelter and students who are stably housed. Broadly speaking, homelessness is often associated with inequities in health outcomes. In an effort to identify unique or acute health challenges faced by students who live in temporary housing, the second bill I'm sponsoring, Intro 139, would expand Dewey's existing reporting requirements to include data on school-based health centers, common student illnesses, and health screenings. This data would be specifically be disaggregated by student housing status for students in kindergarten through grade eight. I wanna thank the advocates, members of the public, and those with lived experience who are joining us remotely today, including any students who are with us. I wanna thank the representatives from the administration for joining us. And I look forward to hearing from you on these critical issues. I'd also like to thank my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, my interim legislative director, Nicole Hunt, and committee staff, Amitha Kilowan, senior counsel, Crystal Khan, senior policy analyst, Natalie Omari, policy analyst, and Frank Sarno, our finance analyst. Um, and uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues who have joined us today. I see council members Lander, Drum, Lewis, Ambry Samuel. Um, and I don't know if anyone else. Oh, Councilor Rose, Councilor Virginero, Councilor Riley. Um, uh, I want to say Councilor Borelli is here as well. Um, uh, and if I'm missing anybody, please. Um, Councilor Adams, Councilor Rosenthal. Um, see anybody else? I don't believe so. Councilor Brandon. 
Councilmember Reno. So <laughs> thank you. All. I want to thank all of my colleagues for joining us. Um, and um, you know, and and lastly, before we begin, I just want to just say, um, you know, we have to do better by the children and shelter in New York City. Um, there's no excuse at all uh, for there to be disparities um, in educational outcomes, in educational services, um, in attendance rates. Um, in uh, inequities with access to technology. Um, there's, we're the, the most, the wealthiest city in America. Um, we have uh, the best school system in America. And um, as I said in my opening statement, with the average length of stay in shelter well over a year and actually approaching um, uh, a year and a half um, in shelter is the average length of stay. That means that there are uh, many children, thousands of children that are staying over two years in shelter. Um, we have a, a, a responsibility to them um, to do everything that we can. And I don't think anybody that's on this, in this hearing today uh, could say, that we're doing everything that we can. Um, and um, until, until such time that we do that, um, we shouldn't rest on our laurel, laurels. Um, we shouldn't be patting ourselves on the back and saying we're doing a good job. Um, frankly, what I wanna hear today is what the plan is to do better, not, not what we've done. Um, that we think we've done right. I wanna know what we're gonna do better. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to um, my co-chair, Mark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Logan, for those words and for your leadership. Um, I think you had mentioned a number of the folks, uh, members that are already on the council, so I will not, uh, not repeat that. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll, have, we'll swear in uh, the administration to testify. Thank you, Chair Treya, and thank you, Chair Levin. I'm Kalima Johnson, Senior Legislative Policy Analyst to the Committee on Education of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted. I will be calling on witnesses to testify in panels, so please listen for your name to be called. I will be announcing in advance who the next panel will be. I would like to remind everyone that, unlike our typical council hearings, while you will be placed on a panel, I will be calling individuals to testify one at a time. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on and the order with which you raised your hand after the full panel has completed testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. This includes both question and answers. Please note that for the purposes of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. Please listen for that cue. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. At the end of two minutes, please wrap up your comments so we can move forward to the next panelist. Please listen carefully and wait for the surgeon to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony as there is a slight delay. Written testimony can be submitted to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Chris Caruso, the Senior Executive Director at the Department of Education's Office of Community Schools. 
Sarah Jonas, the executive director at the Department of Education's Office of Community Schools. Michael Hickey, executive director of Students in Temporary Housing. Lauren Siciliano, the chief administrative officer. Jody Sammons, Chen, the senior, exec, senior director of the Office of Pupil Transportation. Joanne Bennett, the senior executive director of the Office of the First Deputy Chancellor. And Aaron Drinkwater, deputy commissioner of Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs. I will first read the oath and after I will call on each panelist here from the administration individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Chris Caruso? I do. Sarah Jonas? I do. Michael Hickey? I do. Lauren Siciliano? I do. Jody Sammons Chin? I do. Joanne Benoit? Joanne Benoit, I do. My apologies. Erin Drinkwater? I do. Thank you. Chris Caruso, you may begin when ready. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, good morning, Chair Traeger, and a happy belated birthday to you. Uh, Chair Levin and members of the Education and General Welfare Committee uh, who are present today. My name is Christopher Caruso, and I'm the Senior Executive Director of the Office of Community Schools at the Department of Education. I'm joined today by Sarah Jonas, who will soon be the Acting Executive Director of the Office of Community Schools. As some of you know, I will be transitioning from my current role uh, in approximately a week from today. Uh, so I appreciate you guys squeezing us in as a little uh, last minute run through with you guys. Um, Sarah has been my partner in this work uh, since the Office of Community Schools was created six years ago. And I have no doubt that she will carry on the important work with fidelity and supporting our most vulnerable students um, which is something that she's been committed to throughout her whole career. Also joining me today is Michael Hickey, the Executive Director of the Students in Temporary Housing Team at the Department of Education, Lauren Siciliano, DOE's Chief Administrative Officer, Dr. Joanne Benoit, Senior Executive Director of the Division of the First Deputy Chancellor, Jody Sammons Chen from the Office of Pupil, Pers Pupil Transportation, and Aaron Drinkwater. Uh, our colleague at the Department of Social Services who serves as Deputy Commissioner of Legislative Affairs. We are pleased to be here today to discuss the city's work to support students in temporary housing and the proposed legislation. Before I begin, I would like to thank Chairs Traeger and Levin for your continued leadership throughout the pandemic and all that you have done on behalf of our students and families. I would also like to thank the many advocates, nonprofits, and city agency partners that continue to support our students in shelter. Supporting students living in temporary housing, and particularly our students in shelter, has been a top priority for this administration. We recognize that students in temporary housing face distinct challenges and needs that have been further impacted over the past year. The pandemic has had the greatest impact on students with the greatest needs, and our students living in temporary housing have faced immense trauma during this time. We've worked hard to provide targeted supports aimed at addressing their needs and keeping them connected with their school communities. We do this work in close cooperation, leadership and guidance from the Department of Social Services and especially the Department of Homeless Services. The DOE's STH team has a close working relationship with their DHS colleagues. In addition to frequent email, phone exchanges, executive leadership from DOE and DHS meet every two weeks with senior members from our teams to discuss policy, operations, training, and a wide range of related issues. Those include improving attendance and reducing chronic absent absenteeism, informing families and shelter of important DOE services and opportunities, and ensuring that DOE personnel are able to meet with all new families seeking to enter the shelter system 
through the path. As part of the DOE's realignment three years ago, the Students and Temporary Housing Team was placed in the Office of Community Schools as part of the newly formed Division of School Climate and Wellness under Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson's leadership. This was done with two very purposeful goals in mind. First, we wanted to apply the proven successes of the community school strategy in providing students and families with the right supports at the right time. According to a recent national study by the RAND Corporation, our impact on improving credit accumulation and decreasing chronic absenteeism in community schools was even more pronounced among students who reside in temporary housing. And secondly, to make those supports, make sure that those supports were delivered in alignment with the ultimate goal of the Division of School Climate and Wellness, which is making sure that all students, no matter who they are, what they might be dealing with in their lives outside of school or where they live, feel safe, welcome, and supported in their school community while experiencing school as a second home where they can truly thrive. It was fortunate that this intentional alignment between our community school strategy and our supports for students in temporary housing was in place during the pandemic. Schools offering specific and targeted supports had built trust with these students and families and were able to quickly get them important recess resources when the crisis was most severe. For example, in the South Bronx, Gabriel Hernandez, who's the community school director at MS223, and his community-based organization, Arete Education, partnered with Principal Ramon Gonzalez to alleviate student and family barriers to learning once COVID-19 hit. They focused on the whole family and ensuring that all families at the school had STEM and art kits at their home so that they could engage in hands-on learning. They coordinated food support and delivery, eliminated barriers that students might experience in the way of remote learning, and supported families with accessing benefits, including offering wellness workshops, and they even started a hotline for families to call in for support. This is what community schools are all about. The DOE has applied the same approach for homeless students across the city during the pandemic. First, taking into account the most obvious needs, devices and tech support. To date, the DOE has distributed a total of 470,000 iPads, all with data plans, which we prioritized first for homeless students. Nearly 14,000 iPads were delivered to all students in shelter within the first two weeks of schools going remote last spring, and over 50,000 in total have been delivered to all students in temporary housing. At present, there is no backlog of students awaiting devices, and we have continued to work with new families as they arrive in the shelters to get them devices as quickly as possible. In addition, every student in shelter was given headphones to connect with their devices to make the experience of remote learning more accessible for them. We also created several ways for families affected by homelessness to access technology support for remote learning. That included dedicated tech support hotlines with full translation, access for students in temporary housing, in-person tech support available in shelters, and options to swap out LTE service providers from T-Mobile to Verizon, which improved data access. Any student or family residing in a shelter who reports a connectivity problem to the DOE help desk receives a response within 24 hours. In addition, the city is working with Charter and Altice to provide Wi-Fi service to all apartments in existing DHS shelters to be in use beyond 2021 that serve families with children. Planned new families with children shelters that are opening under the Turning the Tide plan will also be included. Moreover, the city will provide Wi-Fi service to all apartments in more than 40 HRA domestic violence shelters, including families with children. So in total, this represents over 200 sites comprising approximately 10,500 units. Beyond devices and technology, we also wanted to understand what other supports our families in temporary housing needed most during the pandemic. Within the first month of remote learning, we conducted a survey of DOE personnel working directly with students and families affected by homelessness, including principals, social workers, parent coordinators, guidance counselors, and our community school directors. Our teams made an enormous effort to make contact with students in temporary housing to determine what the main issues that those students and their families were facing. They found that some of the most common concerns included the need for mental health supports and trauma-informed care. 
as well as other essential benefits such as emergency meals. Knowing this, we were able to make both of these services a priority for our families. We established clear protocols for conducting remote teletherapy with hundreds of social workers and made mental health support and trauma-informed training for staff a priority. We also worked with our food and nutrition services team to make millions of meals available, especially at sites that serve students affected by homelessness. These efforts include food delivery and pickup arrangements with specific shelters, and also additional guidance, training, and engagement efforts have evolved as we have learned lessons from our data and our experiences. With the strong advocacy of the city council, this administration has made significant investments in supporting students living in temporary housing. One guiding principle has been to give schools the resources to build their capacity to meet the differentiated needs of their students. As you are all aware, the McKinney-Bento Homeless Assistant Act requires school districts to take action to remove barriers to enrollment, attendance, and success in school attributable to homelessness. Chancellor's Regulation A101 and A780 outline the DOE's obligations in this regard. And under McKinney-Bento, students identified as living in temporary housing include those living in family shelters, doubled up, or with family or friends due to economic hardship, or in other temporary housing conditions that are not safe or stable. In the 2019-2020 school year, we had just under 100,000 students in our system who experienced homelessness, and over 20,000 students spent time living in DHS shelters. On any given night, about 10,000 students live in a DHS shelter. Almost every school in New York City has students who have experienced homelessness. This is a reality that every school in our system must be equipped to address. But we also know that the numbers of students experiencing homelessness are not evenly distributed across every school, with a subset of schools serving a disproportionate number of students in temporary housing. We understand that we cannot take a one size fits all approach to supporting these students and families. To advance equity and most effectively respond to the university, universal reality of homelessness in New York City schools, we have made the deepest investments in schools with the greatest number of students. In schools with at least 50 students living in shelter, we have hired full-time staff focused on supporting students in temporary housing. Thanks to the advocacy of the council, we now have 100 Bridging the Gap social workers. Bridging the Gap social workers are first and foremost dedicated to supporting the mental health needs of students in temporary housing through direct counseling, group therapy, and even school-wide culture and climate initiatives that destigmatize homelessness. They also provide non-clinical supports, assessing student and family needs while helping them access public benefits and free support services available in school or the larger community. We also have 107 students in temporary housing community coordinators in 103 schools. These roles are based on the role of the community school director in our community schools. And 62 of these schools have both coordinators and bridging the gap social workers on site due to highly, uh, to very high needs. Like bridging the gap social workers, community coordinators work to identify every student affected by homelessness in their school, assess their needs and facilitate access to supports and services available in the school and community. Finally, the DOE has 117 family assistants who work directly in the family shelter system. Family assistants meet with families when they enter the shelter and during their intake process assess family needs. They ensure that families are connected to enrollment, transportation and other DOE supports. They track families as they move from temporary to permanent housing and coordinate communication with schools and other DOE offices. All of these STH dedicated support staff are supported by a team of regional managers in the Office of Community Schools. Experts in navigating the DOE who are trainers, problem solvers, coaches, coaches, and leaders for the school and shelter-based staff. Last September, we knew that despite our, the challenges of reopening our schools for in-person learning, it was especially critical to get many, as many of our most vulnerable students back into school buildings. For many of our students in temporary housing, the school community is among the steadiest, most reliable aspect of their lives with people and resources that they can count on. This remains the case even for the majority of our STH who remain in remote learning. And we are thrilled though, that over 26,000 of our students in temporary housing are currently learning in person. During this period of remote and blended learning, we knew that we had to provide schools with significantly more guidance and resources than usual. And the STH team has attempted to meet these needs in a number of ways. For example, 
we created written guidance for schools to address four key questions that we heard repeatedly. And we offered schools clear protocols for working with bridging the gap social workers, community coordinators, and school-based liaisons to connect with students who are missing or attending online uh, infrequently at their school. The first question that we heard was how can my school tell if a student is living in shelter or doubled up? And in order to address this, we provided a step-by-step -step guidance on using existing DOE data to understand and act on the most up-to-date student housing in information. Next, schools asked what strategies could I deploy to reach students living in shelter? The pandemic has placed a spotlight on disparities that existed long before. Students affected by homelessness face unique barriers that are reflected in their lower attendance rates, higher rates of chronic absenteeism, and challenges to academic progress. During COVID-19, STH staff were trained and supported to conduct multi-component wellness checks with students and families in temporary housing. The third question was, how can I contact students who are living doubled up? Because many families affected with, by homelessness move frequently and experience disruptions to phone and email service. We shared best practices called from the most experienced members of our teams and of our school teams to locate and communicate consistently. These could include networking through trusted teachers and friends at the school or checking in using social media. Lastly, schools asked once we have located the student, what resources are available to support them? And for many families, we knew that essential needs would be a major consideration. And this portion of the guidance provided details on accessing emergency food, health and mental health services, as well as other free public benefit programs. And every student in shelter was automatically enrolled in the Learning Bridges program. Along with this guidance in partnership with five other city agencies, including the Human Resources Administration, DHS, the Administration for Children's Services, and the Department of Youth and Community Development, and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, we created a simple website called Benefits Navigator that provides quick links to the most commonly requested public benefits and services. This site is widely popular, not just with families, but with the staff who support these families for quickly locating community-specific referrals and services. In order to ensure the guidance and services were put into action on the ground, we, group, we worked with schools to engage their dedicated school-based STH liaison and staff focused on supporting students in temporary housing. We significantly expanded and improved our annual McKinney-Vento training on STH, creating a fully online self-paced curriculum in collaboration with our partners and advocates for children. We also dramatically expanded the annual STH Achieve Conference an event for DOE employees focused on sharing knowledge about promising practices, partnerships, and resources. And we hosted some 1,000 DOE employees in 90 workshops sessions over three days. Furthermore, our borough and citywide offices have been providing training and resources on best practices for teachers. And we will build it, be building upon this work through the spring and into next year. In addition, one of the major long-term areas we have been focused on in supporting STH has been transportation. And we have worked with many stakeholders, including families and advocates, gathering extensive feedback on necessary improvements in transportation for students experiencing homelessness. Based on this work, we updated our chancellor's regulation to clarify that the DOE's commitment to provide free transportation supports to all kindergarten through sixth grade students living in shelter. And we expanded related transportation supports. We have implemented more effective communication with families, schools, and shelters, reduced wait time between requests for busing and routing, and have added additional staff to address STH exception requests. As we look ahead, I want to thank the council for your continued advocacy on behalf of the city for stimulus and state funding. Now, with the full stimulus funding, in addition to the full funding of foundation aid, we can deepen our investments to begin to tackle the lasting impacts of the pandemic, building on our commitment to address the needs of all of our students, including our students in temporary housing, who have gone through such incredible challenges over the past years. It's now my privilege and honor to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Sarah Jonas, the incoming interim acting senior executive director of the Office of Community Schools, to provide information on our plans for this summer and other efforts going forward. Thank you, Chris, and good morning, Chairs Traeger and Levin. My name is Sarah Jonas, and as Chris has stated, I will soon be taking over as Acting Senior Executive Director of the Office of Community Schools. Since this is my first hearing before the City Council, I would like to share a little bit about my background. I have spent my career in education, starting as a teacher and then as a community school director. And prior to joining the DOE, 
I was senior director at the Children's Aid National Center for Community Schools, where I helped districts locally and nationally to implement community schools initiatives. I'm excited to take on this new role at such a critical moment, and I'm looking forward to continuing the strong partnership that the Office of Community Schools has maintained with the City Council in the pursuit of delivering impactful programs and supports for our students. As the mayor and chancellor announced on Tuesday, the Summer Rising program is a bold vision for summer learning that will be student-centered, experiential, academically rigorous, and culturally responsive and sustaining. We know that this summer is critical to ensuring continued learning, to building trust, and to creating space for young people to reconnect and re-engage with one another. Summer Rising will provide opportunities for young people in grades K to 12, including students in temporary housing and other vulnerable populations of students most impacted by the pandemic to learn to get outside and engage with their peers and caring adults in safe, supervised and culturally responsive programs, while at the same time readying them for a return to school in September 2021. In a testament to the success of New York City Community Schools, Summer Rising will be grounded in the core features of the community school strategy by offering academics, enrichment, and social emotional support through robust partnerships between schools and trusted community-based organizations. Summer Rising will integrate the DOE's academic supports and the Department of Youth and Community Development's school-based school -based enrichment programming to create a comprehensive summer program, including full day, full week programs for students in grades K to five during this most critical summer for New York City students. Moving forward, our biggest priority for all our students, but especially those in temporary housing, is making sure that we are addressing the academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs that they may be facing as a result of the disruptions and stresses caused by the pandemic. This is why we are providing targeted supports for those hardest hit communities with 27 new community schools and 150 additional social workers, as well as a universal framework for assessing and addressing gaps in academic learning. Let me briefly now turn to the proposed legislation. Intro number 139 requires the addition of health data for students in temporary housing as part of a Department of Health report. We, along with our colleagues at the Department of Health, support the goal of greater understanding of the health needs of all our students. Intro number 150 requires the formation of a task force to study transportation as it relates to students in temporary housing. We support the goals of this bill as well and continue to work diligently and with many stakeholders on the issue of STH transportation. We look forward to further discussion with the council on both of these bills. While we recognize that the past year has been extremely challenging for students and families, the DOE's commitment to our students in temporary housing and specifically our students in shelter has been unwavering throughout this trying time. We testify here today to share the highlights and lessons learned from our shared experiences and to recognize that there is still a tremendous amount of work to be done. The administration remains committed to knowing and meeting the needs of our students in shelter. We will continue to build on the investments that we have made with the partnership of the council in order to better serve our students in shelter across the city. I am appreciative of the opportunity to serve in this role and look forward to working with you to expand the community school strategy, to serve all our students well, and to help every one of our students to reach their full potential. Thank you, and now we are happy to address any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for your testimony. So I know we've also been joined by Council Members Cornegy, Council Member Gibson, Council Member Rodriguez, Council Member Credentia, Council Member Levine. Uh, and if anyone else, just folks can, can message me, I, I'll, I'll announce them as well. I want to first uh, just acknowledge and thank uh, Mr. Chris Caruso uh, for his incredible service to the city of New York and for believing uh, in community schools uh, before many others did. And um, I am a big believer in community schools. They work, the research shows it. Um, it is never a mistake to invest in, in community schools and every school should be a community school. It is those connections and relationships in community schools that have really carried many of our kids and communities forward. 
during this very trying time. And just imagine if every school was a community school during this time, how many more connections and relationships we could have maintained and sustained. So Chris, thank you for your service. I just wanna begin by acknowledging that because it, it, it's not been easy. And uh, I just, just wanna thank you and congratulations, uh, uh, Sarah Jonas on, uh, on your soon to be taking over of, of the critical position in our, in our school system. Um, I wanna begin, just get right, right, to the, right to some key questions that we have. Um, how many students, uh, just, to, just, to, just so we're all on the same page, because uh, data is really important to us. How many students as of this moment does a DOE uh, know are in temporary housing total citywide? Thank you, Chair Traeger. Um, it's been an honor to work beside you and I've appreciated your consistent advocacy on behalf of community schools. Um, so uh, the last report that, that we published, there were 97,943 students uh, who were identified as living in temporary housing. And that was as of when? That was at the conclusion of the 2019-2020 school year. So that number, particularly in the moment they were in, do you feel that that number has grown? Um, you know, it's a, it's a number that's in flux um, over the course of the year. What that indicates is that last year, those 97,943 students spent at least one night in shelter um, or spent one night um, in other some sort of temporary housing. So if we took a snapshot right now, I, it's hard to say whether it would have been increased or decreased because we still have another couple months left of the school year. We try to compare year over year data um, because it's a full academic year snapshot. And of this number, uh, do you have just an up-to-date figure to share with the council, the number of students who are doubled up and students who are in shelter? Yeah, of that number, uh, 30,459 had spent time uh, in a city shelter. And the subset of that in the DHS shelter system was 20,775. And the balance were living in uh, doubled up situations. Um, and thank you, Mr. Professor, for that. Those for those figures, uh, very sobering numbers. Um, uh, do we have data on how many students um, in in shelter or overall students in temporary housing? are still without internet connectivity. Do we have an update number on that? Um, I'm really pleased that my colleague, Lauren Siciliano, who's been such a steadfast leader and making sure that our students have connectivity is joining us today. Uh, and so Lauren, I'll ask you to address that question. Absolutely, thank you, Chris. And good morning, Chair Traeger and the council. Um, we have been prioritizing our students in temporary housing for device distribution from the start. Um, in fact, our students in the shelter were the first students to receive uh, the LTE enabled iPads that we purchased. Um, I'm very pleased to say that as of now, there is not a backlog of students who are in need of devices. Um, this, uh, uh, as you know, the device need is constantly fluid students who have access to device and connectivity yesterday may not have access today. So we are, of course, continuing to monitor this and to fulfill requests as they come in. Um, and particularly for our students in the shelter, um, as, as Chris outlined, we have uh, additional supports available through the Medicaid help desk and through on-site text as well. Um, but I'm, I'm very pleased to report that. And of course, we will continue to um, meet additional needs as they come in. And I I, I appreciate that answer. I, I, although I, I asked how many of them still cannot connect to the internet because uh, even if they receive the device, uh, we, we've heard numerous reports that in 
shelters, uh, they can't catch a Wi-Fi signal, and that's been a challenge for them. Do we have any any data on that? Absolutely. So for students in shelter, the iPads, as you know, are LTE enabled, which means that you can connect to the internet even if you don't have Wi-Fi access using um, using cellular service. Um, we did, as you know, uh, have issues with students who um, had T-Mobile supported devices who could not connect to the cellular T-Mobile network. And we swapped out those devices for um, Verizon whenever that was an issue. So we have addressed those requests that we received. There's not a backlog right now. And again, if new requests come in, we continue to address those as well. So, so to be clear, because you know, if this is the case, then this is certainly a positive step forward. Uh, there are no students in temporary housing shelter or that you know of that is currently in need of internet service or a device. Is that, is that, is that what you're saying? That's correct. There's no backlog. I do want to stress that this is extraordinarily fluid. There are new requests that are coming in every moment and we are addressing them in real time as they come in. And of course, um, if you hear of students who are struggling with connectivity, please continue to let us know and we will troubleshoot uh, to address those issues. The most common thing that we've been hearing in, in recent you know, uh, weeks and months is that um, it's also making sure that they get still the appropriate device uh, particularly older students um, getting Chromebooks and with internet connectivity, that that is, are, are you still getting reports and requests on that with regards to not just the Chromebook, but also, you know, the hotspots that come, because Chromebooks, I don't think they come internet enabled. You have to get a separate device to connect them to the internet. Are you aware of those requests? So, um, uh, a few things that I'll say about that. One is that we do have hotspots available for students who have a device but are not able to connect to the internet. And schools can request those the same way that they've been requesting the iPads. Um, so for any for any student who's in need of those, they can make those requests. Um, uh, in terms of uh, instances in which the device might not be the appropriate one, um, we have um, ordered uh, Case, uh, keyboard case orders. So since the summer, we've been purchasing keyboard cases for our iPads. We have about 190,000 keyboard cases in the system right now. And if a student is struggling with the screen on the iPad and they need a keyboard case, they can reach out to our help desk for support. And, and Warren, just for context, uh, how, how recent would you say the DOE has delivered some of these devices or switched out the T-Mobile for the Verizon devices. Are, are we talking about that this happened uh, a, a few weeks ago or did this happen six months ago? Can you give us any time frame on that? It's, it's been happening. And as we request the in, we're addressing them real time. Right. Uh, it's, it's my concern that a number of students um, you know, started the remote shift from last March, not having a device internet. I know that there were many issues and reasons for that, but still the fact is many kids did not really have the same start to remote learning as their peers. Um, we previously learned at previous hearings that uh, thousands of children entered the, the fall school year and still not having a device internet. So I just wanna kind of give a context for my colleagues and, and the public that there are many kids who did not start at the same time as many of their peers and went months and months and months of interrupted instruction or just uh, just kind of a disjointed um, uh, schedule of, of starting the remote learning. Um, I wanna to get to attendance. Uh, the January 21 attendance data released by the DOE in response to local law 10 of 21 show that students in shelter had the worst attendance rate of any student uh, subgroup. Can you please tell us the attendance rate for the full school year to date for number one, students in temporary housing generally, uh, two, students who are doubled up, and three, students living in shelter? Yes. Um, and the data that I will be giving you is through uh, February 26th. So it's through the last uh, full month that we reported on. Um, 
year-to-date attendance rates for all students is 88.5%. Um, year-to-date for uh, students in temporary housing. Um, so this includes doubled up and students in sheltered, shelter, excuse me, is 81.8%. And uh, year-to-date um, attendance rates for students living in shelter is 73.7%. I don't have with me the year to date for only the doubled up portion of the students in temporary housing, but we could follow up with that data. Now, does, does that include uh, high school as well, just, just to be clear? It does. Okay. Um, these are very concerning numbers um, and I just want to you know, just kind of start off by, start off by saying that. Um, now, given uh, the low attendance rate, um, also, actually, actually, Mr. Crusoe, just before I, I get there, um, we understand that uh, many of the uh, 117 shelter-based DOE family assistants are working remotely and are not on site at, at the shelters. Uh, do you have data on how many family assistants are currently working remotely? Um, I'm going to ask my colleague, Mike Hickey, who supervises the team uh, that supports our shelter-based family assistants to talk a little bit about the role that they play and how many of them are currently uh, working in person in shelters. Mike? Thanks, Chris. And Chair Trigger, I appreciate the question. Um, as you know, the Department of Education's 117 STH family assistants, their role is to meet with families as they enter the shelter system to um, connect and conduct an intake with them and ensure that those families are being referred to enrollment, transportation, and other important supports uh, just to make sure their child's education isn't interrupted. During the pandemic, uh, when we initially went into remote learning at the end, uh, or sorry, last spring, um, of course, all of our family assistants were working remotely. Um, that was a decision we made in close collaboration with our partners in labor in DC 37. Um, when we looked to the return to school at the beginning of the fall, again, discussing this situation with them, we were able to make the determination that family assistants who were not on a medical accommodation could return to working in person as long as there was a place in the shelter where they could be, you know, maintain social distancing um, and have appropriate health and safety precautions in place. The about 50%, um, just under 60 of our STH family assistants are currently on medical accommodation, meaning that no matter what the conditions in the shelter, they have a health risk that would keep them from being able to continue to work in person. Um, those accommodations will continue through the end of June this year. Um, we have provided since last spring, since we were 100% remote last spring, very detailed guidance for any staff member that's working remotely about how to continue their activities including very extensive guidance on conducting wellness check-ins and outreach to families as they enter shelter, even if they have to do it via phone, video, or text. Uh, you know, I'm just, you know, took notes again on the attendance figures and um, they're deeply sobering because I think, I don't have to tell you, Chris, that um, attendance is a, is a major indicator of school climate and what's happening. And, 73%, I mean, that is, uh, you know, I, so it just gets, I, I'll get right to it. You know, given the, the low attendance rate for students in shelter um, and the number of, of DOE family assistants working remotely, which we're hearing is about half or so, what is the city doing to help students in shelter connect with school? Um, what can you tell us about the barriers to connection and what is the city's plan to improve these attendance rates? Yeah, um, we agree that it is important to improve these attendance rates. Um, around this country, every school district 
has been grappling with how do we identify and reconnect with our students. This is not a challenge that's unique to New York, um, yet it is one that we take very seriously and one that we are committed to um, addressing. In my testimony, I talked about how we are employing the community school strategy to connect people to resources, to make sure that our families have what they need. That's an essential part of this. I think that even though family assistance, um, many of them have been working remotely, a lot of this work is about personal connections. How do we deploy mentors to make sure that our students know that they're valued and loved and missed when they're not in school? How do we make sure that our schools are doing follow-up with those students? Um, so those are some of the strategies that, that we are using. I will say that, and you know, Lauren spoke about our commitment to providing access to technology and the ramp up of that early on in the year and how we prioritized our students in, in temporary housing. Um, the, we have seen an increase, a quite dramatic increase since the beginning of the year, attendance rates to where we are now. So we know that we're on the right trajectory. And just as a, if I may, um, at the end of November, um, the attendance rates for students in shelter was um, several percentage points below uh, where we are now, hovering just a, around 70%. And so we have been making progress. And once, you know, when you start off behind, it's, it's quite challenging to, to catch up. Um, I think that the work of our schools um, to make online learning more engaging, uh, to do outreach and uh, really cultivate the relationships with families has been essential. And Mike, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, some of the ways that our um, Bridging the Gap social workers and community coordinators have been um, really you know, aggressive at making contact with families. Thanks, Chris. Uh, again, just to frame this, that I think we all carry a real awareness that um, this is a period of heightened exposure to risk and trauma for these students and families. And we wanted to make sure that we were really equipping uh, the members of the STH team, whether they're social workers, coordinators, or family assistants with the right guidance and tools to really make a meaningful difference still, even if they were working remotely. Um, I mentioned wellness check-ins before. I wanna spend just go quickly through some of the things that we're asking in those check-ins. So um, we created direct guidance for each of these staff members in their role that included a lot of information. For instance, for Bridging the Gap Social Workers, the guidance included how to conduct uh, remote uh, teletherapy and counseling and the permissions that would be required in order to continue providing clinical services even in a remote environment. We also trained our staff to make sure in each wellness check-in they were asking questions about the student's ability to access remote learning and they required uh, technical support that might be needed to check in about how students were faring emotionally and asking them if they wanted to set aside some time to talk um, in order to work through any feelings of distress they were experiencing. How are students feeling physically, not just for them, but for their family members? Were there any health or other emergency issues that needed to be addressed? And were there any other outstanding issues? We found a lot of our families did have some real concerns about food and hunger. And so making sure that we could direct them to emergency food supports was critical. So just to say that this outreach, before we can get students to school, we have to make sure that students are feeling um, psychologically, physically ready to get to school. And the work of our team is about making sure that we're removing those barriers initially. The other thing so I- Michael, if I can interject quickly, um, yes. how, how do you ensure that the outreach and the wellness calls and whatever communication uh, the, the system takes to, to reach our students, how do you make sure it doesn't increase trauma or increase harm because of the concerning reports that we, we, we had about uh, ACS case referrals? Uh, if there's a family that's experiencing trauma, which we all you know, acknowledge that if you're homeless already, that's a very traumatic experience. How do, we, how do we make sure that we're not adding trauma and not adding harm? Because we are getting reports 
that in some cases that that happened. So first off, just to be clear, uh, when members of the students temporary housing team are reaching out to families, they are um, checking in to make sure again, people are doing well, students are stable and healthy. Um, they, if they encounter a situation, for instance, where a student is disconnected from school and where there might be a risk of an educational neglect report, they will actually work directly with an ACS counterpart, with the school, uh, in order to make sure that those reports, um, that all other uh, circumstances are addressed before any kind of educational neglect um, effort or, or outreach is made to ACS. I want to also be clear that the DOE has defined very specific guidance for schools around educational neglect reports. Attendance and remote learning are not reasons to report educational neglect. Finally, um, just we, we also track the numbers. So we're in close communication with our ACS colleagues. Um, and in fact, year over year, uh, educational neglect cases have been declining. That includes for uh, the year-to-date period this year in comparison to last year. And I would just add to that, Chair, that the, the work here and the outreach is being done by trusted community members, right? And I think the beauty of the Bridging the Gap program is that this is not a stranger from the district office or someone from Tweed that's calling a family to say, why aren't you in school? Right. This is, you know, Mr. Hickey or whoever it might be that I see in my classroom that like reaches out to me on a regular basis. And so it is built on those relationships that we think is why families will be receptive uh, and open to this idea. This is work for the long term. Like we cannot we have to create school climates that are welcoming and warm and embracing all of our children and families, no matter what their housing situation is. And students and families need to feel that from people that they trust and love. And so the idea that a wellness check is being done by, you know, some bureaucrat in a tie is not the case here. These are people on the ground that families know day in and day out. Right. And, and my, my question is when, now that, you know, you mentioned that as of February, the attendance for kids in shelter is 73.7%. Um, what's the response? What's the plan? Uh, and and, and what, are, what can we say are the barriers to attendance at this point? If you're saying that internet and technology is no longer a barrier, what is the barrier now? Yeah, I mean, look, a, a, across the board, attendance is down, right? And unfortunately, New York and many other cities see that students who experience homelessness are more likely to miss school than uh, their peers who are permanently housed. And that's why we've taken such a robust effort to invest in school-based services to make sure that schools that are disproportionately impacted um, by poverty and economic needs have the resources they need to make connections and support these students and families. Chris, uh, are Metro cards mailed to students or do they have to come to the school to pick it up? Yeah, we've made, um, I, I think, a, a lot of progress on uh, including updating Chancellor's regs on uh, how we meet our obligation to provide transportation supports uh, for students in temporary housing. And I'm glad that my colleague Jody Sammons uh, from the Office of Pupil Personnel or Office of Pupil Transportation uh, is on uh, the call with us. And Jody, I'd love you to answer that question. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, council members. Um, we are committed to reducing the burden on families, particularly those in temporary housing. So students only pick up Metro cards twice per year, one in the fall and one in the spring, and they do pick them up from their schools. Um, we cannot mail them because they do have monetary value, but we do provide students in temporary housing with a Metro card to get to and from the school the first time to pick up their Metro card. Jody, the parents but, and guardians, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please continue, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, their parents and guardians are also eligible to receive a Metro card to travel with their child to and from school. And um, this is something that we've also made um, a process improvement this year in partnership with uh, the students and temporary housing team to make them available at the schools instead of at the borough citywide offices. 
And then we've also made these monthly so that the parents do not have to travel that often to pick them up. And Jody, is it accurate to say that at the start of the school year, the DOE stated that if students opt or families opted for full remote, that they would not be given a, a metro card? Is that, is that correct? So that's correct for the general population, but not for students in temporary housing. We were able to give students in temporary housing metro cards and to continue to assign these metro cards to the students on a, on a long-term basis so that they could get to and from their enrichment opportunities as well as to pick up free meals from the city. Yeah, and to be clear, I, as I stated in previous hearings, I disagreed with that policy even for the general student population because many students opted for full remote, no fault of their own. Uh, they're now taking on additional roles, helping their parents pay rent working. And so we should have provided everyone with the Metro card at the start. I, I wanna just uh, finalize in terms of my colleagues who've been very patient. Um, the uh, number of students in temporary housing who are signed up for uh, in-person versus remote right now, do we have data on that? Yes, um, we do. Um, there are um, 26,221 students uh, participating in blended learning, and there are 54,012 students participating in full remote learning. Um, and this is as of, I think, a week ago or so, early, early April, we'll call it. And why do you believe that the majority of students in temporary housing, even with the opportunities to uh, re-enroll in uh, blended learning. Why do you think that the majority still has have still opted for full remote? I think that you know we value parental choice in this decision, and I think parents are assessing what's best for their children at any given point in time, taking into consideration their own employment status, childcare needs, and a number of other things. Um, and it's been important to this administration uh, to make sure that parents have choice this year. And Chris, when you have students who are doubled up, um, and just to kind of spell that out further, there are multiple folks in a, in a dwelling and very likely not a very large dwelling. And uh, I, as a teacher, I could tell you, it is a challenge to get folks, students to pay attention, to keep their attention, even with a sizable class, uh, and I can only imagine what students are going through as far as trying to have a kind of a quiet you know, space to, to learn and to pay attention. Um, and it is very concerning about the amount of instructional uh, loss that our kids are experiencing in addition to their to social emotional disconnections uh, at, at this time. Uh, and the final question, I'll turn to, to Chair Levin, is um, what is the city doing? You know, I, I, I joined the mayor and I, and I thank you, Chris, for, for your help in spearheading uh, the Summer Rising program. What are we doing to make sure that there is absolutely no barrier, zero barrier for registration to make it as seamless as possible for all of our kids, particularly students in temporary housing, to register to sign up for the, for the summer programming because these kids absolutely need it. Yeah, we are incredibly excited about the vision for Summer Rising. This is an opportunity uh, to get children off of screens, to get them back uh, in person, to connect with their peers, um, to learn and address their unfinished learning, um, to play and have opportunities for recreation. Um, throughout this year, we have shown a commitment to making sure that, our, that we reduce any structural barriers to students participating in the efforts that we're making um, to support all our students. And I, I think a good example of this is the Learning Bridges program. Um, you mentioned students who are doubled up and um, how, what type of learning environment they have to participate in remote learning. Um, learning Bridges was an opportunity where kids can go to a nearby um, center staffed by our amazing community-based organizations and participate in uh, remote learning from a supervised and welcoming environment. We automatically enrolled every student in shelter in that system. 
There was no need for parents to find out what the right link was, who do I have to call, what kind of documentation do I need to show. It was a given. They were enrolled in the system, and then we did the follow-up to make sure they knew they were enrolled and how they could get there. With, Lear uh, with Summer Rising, we will be having an extensive outreach campaign. We have staff on the ground in our community-based organizations in our neighborhoods um, to connect with students and families. Um, we will make sure that our colleagues at DHS and our staff that work in shelters have all the information they need um, so that children know what their opportunities are. And one thing I think is really important and I wanna highlight here, as you know, Chair Trigger, many of our children in temporary housing travel quite a distance uh, to participate in school because they are entitled to stay in their school of origin, which is an incredible right that they have. For Summer Rising, if it's more convenient for that family to attend Summer Rising in the local elementary school across the street from their shelter, they're welcome to do that. There's no barrier in terms of um, getting back to that school of origin. If they choose to wanna stay with their friends and make that trip, that's fine too, but we think that that's going to be um, a critical pathway to help ensure that our students in temporary housing have access to these programs. Thank you for that answer. And I'll turn it over to Chair Levin. Thank you for your patience, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Traeger. Um, I wanna thank uh, um, the administration for your answers so far. Um, I'm gonna start uh, uh, to ask with, uh, for your reaction to the report that came out yesterday in the Daily News um, regarding um, uh, the lower attendance rate um, among um, remote learners in temporary shelter um, compared to their uh, more stably housed cohorts in the city. Um, what, what is the explanation um, for that at this point? My reaction is disappointment and not surprise. This is what we see nationally. This is what our trends have been in New York. As I said to Chair Traeger, we are committed to creating warm and welcoming environments. I think that at the beginning of the school year, it was a big transition, not only for our families, but for our teachers. Um, we've improved our systems over the course of the school year and we see attendance rates rising in recent months. Okay, but what's the what? I mean, what's the explanation though for, um, with remote learning in particular? You know, uh, what would be the explanation that you would identify now, uh, or some contributing factors now, uh, for specifically what went into um, uh, these lower rates? And I think that they were for January of this year. So. Um, I mean, I'll just read here. 10th graders who, in, who were in shelters uh, saw the lowest attendance rates logging in 64% uh, of the time in January, a rate 18% lower than their classmates in stable housing, according to an analysis of DOE attendance data from Advocates for Children. And just so I want to note that, that um, because there were no high school classes in person in the month of January, that, that um, can be assumed to be all remote uh, logins. So um, we're seeing a kind of uh, pretty significant um, uh, uh, disparity there. What are we trying to, uh, how are we, what, I wanna get some specifics here. What, what is, um, what have we uh, focused in on as, as potentially the cause of that disparity? We're talking about purely remote learning. So it's not, it doesn't have, this, this particular uh, issue does not have to do with transportation obviously. Um, so what's causing that? What do we think is, are some of those causes? Yeah, I think that our superintendents and um, principals have been working very hard um, to make sure that um, our online and remote learning opportunities are as robust and as engaging as possible. Um, we're joined today by Dr. Jo Joanne Benoit, um, who works in the division of the first deputy chancellor and does a lot of work and training superintendents uh, and supports for that. And Joanne, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the ways um, that we've been working to improve our uh, remote learning capabilities. Yes, good morning again, everyone. Uh, good morning, uh, council. Um, 
It has, as Chris has said, um, Mike has said, um, it has been, you know, a challenge, not just nationally, but um, citywide for us, right, to ensure that all of these students are engaged and that their families also, you know, have the resources and opportunities to help them engage in remote, um, the remote learning setting. Both students in shelter and high school students face unique barriers to learning this year due to the pandemic, as we know, which has deepened existing um, disparities. Students in shelters experience significant disruption um, and trauma in their daily lives, which make it difficult for many families and students to engage on a daily basis. Uh, many high school students took on additional um, work and responsibilities during the pandemic, either looking after younger siblings or working to support the family, as um, Chairman Traeger mentioned himself. When students are at risk of being chronically absent, we respond as a whole school community to identify individual student needs and work to address those barriers in their particular situation. Um, schools uh, district staff, uh, borough citywide offices um, have looked throughout this year and actually since the beginning of the pandemic to align the services to um, these families. Um, the data managers at the borough and citywide offices have con continuously uh, disaggregated the data to ensure that they've identified these students and have worked with attendance teachers, um, as well as uh, classroom teachers, counselors, um, as well as the uh, STH uh, family assistance to keep in touch and in contact with families so that we know what the issues are. Um, we have uh, uh, partnered with um, community-based organizations such as uh, Morningside Center, the Children's Aid Society, just to provide teachers with additional supports um, and resources, toolkits to specifically meet, meet the needs of students in temporary housing. Um, borough and citywide offices are providing professional learning opportunities to administrators at the school. Um, as well as family leadership coordinators, family support coordinators um, on the district side um, to Dr. Bimai, better if I, may, if I may interrupt just for a second. I, I, yes. um, what I, I'm trying to get at is, is what are some of the, what are some of the specific causes that we're looking at of why a student in temporary housing is having a harder time attending than a student that's that's stably housed on, because the, I, what you mentioned about, you know, taking on additional responsibilities for high school students, I mean, that's that's across the board. So that, that I would imagine that students in stable housing are also taking on additional responsibilities in their families' um, daily activities. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to try to drill down a little bit on why we're seeing for remote learning in the month of January where everybody's remote for, for high school students, why are we seeing such a disparity? Um, you know, because I mean, I think that, you know, as we look at larger trends, if we had had this hearing uh, 18 months ago, we could say, listen, okay, we, we have real challenges with transportation. We have real challenges, um, you know, around connecting to existing school communities and the shelter capacity issues and and so that you know you could be in you could be um in have your child in school in brooklyn mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're, you're placed in a shelter in queens those issues are not at play here so so what i'm i really want to know what issues are we identifying as we're kind of diagnosing this issue i sympathize yeah. <laughs> i'm right there with you um, Sure, Levin. Uh, I think that there, like, look, I think that the differentiated impact of this pandemic on communities of color and low income communities has been well documented. And I yeah, think, no, no, I not surprised, so, uh, as I don't think it's surprising that our students in temporary housing, for some of the reasons that Chair Traeger mentioned around access to um, a, a welcoming environment to participate. Um, uh, to um, kind of uh, accessing the, 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 the content. Um, these are the reasons why many of, you know, the, the, it's the reason why a student in temporary housing does not participate in remote learning is not that different than the reason why a 
student who is permanently housed doesn't participate. It's mm. that the, there's a culmination and an exponential effect on adverse childhood um, um, experiences that make it that much more difficult. And it's our obligation to remove those barriers and make connections with those children and families. Okay, I'm not totally satisfied with that answer, but I, I will move on. Um, yeah. um, uh, there's, uh, I wanna ask um, uh, Deputy Commissioner um, Drinkwater um, about um, length of stay. So what is DSS or DHS doing uh, uh, from a broader perspective, and we see it, we see now the length of stay obviously is, has really shot up. Uh, 10 years ago, it was 200 and some odd days, um, increasing to around four, an average, you know, around 430, 440, 450 days uh, for families with children um, from years 2015 through, through 2019. Um, and and then I think we're, we were talking about 495, I believe, is what it, um, the the um, what the latest data is showing. Um, what is DSS doing to reduce the average length of stay, and what is the game plan, particularly with families with children, to reduce that length of stay? Because if one thing that we're seeing is if attendance rates, even remote attendance rates are so much lower for students in temporary housing and students that are stably housed. And the very best thing that we could do is make sure that that length of time that they're in temporary housing is reduced. Thank you for the question, council member, and thank you for your dedication to our students and shelter. Um, for the length of stay, I wanna point out that one of the best things that we can do to address length of stay is to address entry into shelter in the first place. Uh, we've invested seriously in our prevention tools in terms of paying rent arrears, uh, the recreation of various rental assistance programs, the universal access to counsel. All of those investments prior to the pandemic have been driving down the Families with Children census. We've seen the census further decline because of the eviction moratorium um, but it's important to note that those investments are paying off and we're avoiding entry into shelter and we're seeing the overall number of families in shelter decline. In respect to the length of stay, uh, our rental assistance programs are important in terms of transitioning families out of shelter. Um, building those programs up has been critically important to move families out, um, as well as looking to the mayor's housing plan and increasing affordable housing across the city so families are able to exit shelter more quickly. Okay, I think that this is something that um, even though, you know, we're in the kind of waning days of this administration, um, you know, I hope to see more on, um, I would um, appreciate the administration's support on intro 146 that I'm sponsoring, which would increase the uh, city FAPS voucher amounts to make them a more viable option for families uh, leaving shelter so that they're not stuck with a voucher that's paying 80% of fair market rent in a city that is a fair market rent city. Um, so um, anyone from the administration, if you're uh, talking to your um, colleagues at OMB um, or at City Hall, um, one thing that you can recommend to them to help address this issue uh, in moving children out of shelter and back into permanent housing is to support raising the city FEPS voucher rates to fair market rent, which is what intro 146 does. For the record, the administration is very opposed to this and OMB is very opposed to this. And uh, I've been, we've been fighting for a long time for that. So um, I once again call on the administration um, to support this legislation. Um, uh, Chris, you had mentioned um, earlier about, um, I think you said that they're um, providing uh, iPads to, uh, I'm looking at your testimony here, to 50,000 um, uh, students, is that right? Um, yes, that's right. Um, but 
but also in your testimony, you've acknowledged that, right, so uh, nearly 14,000 iPads were delivered to all students in temporary housing within the first two weeks, and over 50,000 total have been delivered to all students in temporary housing. But then also in your testimony, you acknowledge that um, under McKinney-Vento definition, there's uh, closer to uh, 100,000 students in temporary housing that meet that definition under McKinney-Vento. What are we doing for those students that are not in that 50,000 cohort um, that have received that have received those iPads, um, but are in um, that are that are also under the definition of uh, temporary housing under McKinney-Vento? Yeah, and I, I could start and then ask Lauren to to jump in. Um, any student that was identified as being in temporary housing was prioritized. Um, and furthermore, any student in the system was eligible. And so um, we wanted to, you know, take an equity stance here and start with our students who um, were among some of our most vulnerable and prioritize them at the top. Um, but since then, we've opened it up to any student. And as Lauren mentioned earlier, uh, we currently don't have a backlog. And so between kind of the outreach that we've done and not only centrally, but like schools and teachers, if a child is not logging on or not having, um, is, is having connectivity issues, they can also help the parent make the request for the device. That's, that's absolutely right, Chris. And I, all I would add is that the, the 54,000 number, that is the, um, number of students in temporary housing who have received iPads who uh, outside of the shelter system. Um, another 24,000 on top of that 54,000 um, have received iPads um, at the time they were, they were in the shelter system. Um, uh, with the effort on, um, on upgrading all shelters to be Wi-Fi, um, you know, to have workable Wi-Fi. Um, I, 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 my understanding is that the, um, the, the objective date to do that, or the, you know, the date to, to try to do that um, was initially set for um, right before the, the coming fall semester, then it was moved up to the end of the spring semester. Now it's moved back to the beginning of the fall semester. Can, um, can we get a little bit of an update on, on, on that process and, um, and, and uh, where, um, where the progress stands on that and um, uh, what are the obstacles? What, what's, what's gone into this changing of, of, uh, of dates that we see and, and, uh, and how are we addressing that? Sure. Yeah, I, I, if, if I would turn that over to Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater um, to address. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, so we're, you know, really happy uh, with the partnership with Do It in terms of the installation. I know we recently communicated an update uh, to Chairman Traeger about our progress on the installations, and happy to report that that progress continues today. Um, as of uh, earlier this week, yesterday, installations have occurred at 133 facilities, which uh, counts for over uh, 6,100 units. We are currently uh, complete with 29 of the 30 prioritized sites. The one outstanding site is delayed due to site-related construction activities. And then we are currently underway, or excuse me, do it is underway with construction at additional 21 locations, which account for an additional approximate 1,200 units. Um, we do expect this work uh, to be complete by the end of summer. Um, and we'll keep the committee updated on any progress that's made as this installation takes place. Thank you. Uh, before I get to the next question, I want to acknowledge council members, uh, Baron, Kalos, Salamanca, and Ulrich. Um, I want to ask about um, uh, in light of the um, the historic nature of the um, uh, scope of educational services that that students in temporary housing have have missed in the last year, um, and um, and also in light of the uh, historic now federal investment uh, that we're uh, that we're receiving, um, 
what is what are some of the um, additional um, uh, academic and social emotional uh, programming um, that DOE is, is looking to provide to students in temporary housing specifically. So is it, are, uh, are we looking at uh, extra tutoring services? Um, I know you mentioned um, uh, um, uh, uh, social workers. I give uh, Chairman Traeger credit uh, for fighting for that so vociferously for the last several years. Um, on the budget, um, because keep in mind that was not originally um, supported by the administration. Um, uh, but what are what are the what are some of the uh, academic supplemental academic services that we're looking to provide using uh, new federal funds? Yeah, um, as the mayor has said, this is the best budget that we've seen for New York City in a while. I think the influx of federal stimulus dollars, in addition to um, the work in Albany to honor the commitment to um, increase um, school funding is gonna be tremendously beneficial um, for all students, but especially for students um, who are our most resilient and vulnerable, uh, including students in temporary housing. Um, there's um, a bunch of work happening right now uh, to understand the guidelines federally on how we can use the stimulus funding um, and to develop um, uh, plans to do so. Um, so know that this is a work in progress and after the executive budget comes out in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll have more details. But I can point to two very specific things um, that we, we've already announced that are underway um, that will have a direct impact on our students experience homelessness. First, um, is we've announced an expansion of the community schools work. Um, we will be rolling out um, community schools, new community schools in September uh, in each of the neighborhoods most hardest hit by the pandemic. Um, that is actively underway and we are on track. Uh, and for those of you that have um, you know, worked in city procurement. The fact that we're going to turn this around in, in eight months is something to be said, but we are on track to be having uh, community-based organizations, community school directors hired and services in place by the first day of school um, this coming September. And so that's going to have um, a huge impact. And, um, you know, as has been our practice, we prioritize um, schools with high numbers of students in shelter and students who are doubled up when we are assessing the criteria to, to decide um, which schools can most benefit from that investment at this time. And what does the investment look like? What, uh, what are we, the dollar what amount? No, 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 I mean, what's the, what, what are we talking about in terms of how, what's, what's the investment gonna get us? Oh, so um, why don't I turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Jonas, who can talk a little bit about um, the plan to launch these 27 community schools and what families can expect by going to a community school. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so as Chris said, we're so excited to have this opportunity to really expand the community school footprint into these communities that are hardest hit by the pandemic. Uh, and as in any community school, um, what we're talking about here are deep partnerships between schools and community-based organizations, because we know that schools can't do this work alone of supporting the whole child. Uh, so through this community school strategy and in these neighborhoods, schools will be partnering with a community-based organization to provide academic support, social and emotional supports, uh, enrichment programs, things like after school programming, um, adult education and other types of parent engagement uh, activities, and really a whole wealth of uh, supports for students in all of these spaces, including health, mental health, uh, really looking at the particular needs of the students and families and through the partnerships and the leveraging um, and tapping into community assets and resources, providing these supports for children and families in these communities. Um, I remember when we had a hearing on students in temporary housing several years ago, and a principal testified about, um, as I think as a member of CSA, testified um, about um, having like a, a washing machine and dryer uh, in her school to be able to uh, have students in temporary housing have access to washing their clothes. Um, are those the types of uh, services that we're talking about in a community school? 
Yeah, so absolutely. So in any um, in any community school, really, we're looking at, you know, the, the school together with the families and the communities and the community based partners are looking at the particular needs and assets of that community, and then developing the community school programs and services based on those identified needs. So the example you gave, uh, you know, in schools that have uh, students in temporary housing, that is one of the strategies or one of the supports that uh, the school might identify and the community school partnership could help to bring to the school. Um one thing that uh, has been uh, that was clear prior and was an issue prior to COVID was that students in, in shelter in particular um, were not able to attend after school programming because they could not get transportation back to a shelter if it was a you know a significant distance away um, from their school you know as part of the you know after the after school uh, programming. Um, that was a real problem. Um, and if a student wanted to stay in their um, school of origin um, while in shelter, um, you know, it was virtually impossible to get a bus home. Um, how are we going to address that once we're, you know, hopefully soon back to uh, all in person learning? Yeah, I appreciate um, the mention of after school services which um, we think are incredibly important um, to provide the experiences um, that children need to thrive. When we think about um, the ways that our middle and upper class families support their families through piano lessons and sports leagues and chess clubs, um, oftentimes our um, students living in poverty don't have access to these same experiences and those can shape a student's perspective on learning and grappling with text and uh, really participating fully in the educational experience. We're really proud that this administration has made um, after school universal for middle school. Um, so in every middle school across the city, um, uh, there are free um, after school programs mm -hmm. um, through the Schools Out New York City um, initiative. Um, and many of our uh, elementary schools also have uh, after school programs. Um, students, um, in addition to school based after school programs, uh, there are a number of center based programs as well, including many in um, tier two family shelters. Um, and so I know that when I worked at the Department of Youth and Community Development, um, we were really proud that for the first time we invested in um, uh, direct contracts with Homes for the Homeless so that the Saratoga Family Inn uh, would have a full after-school program uh, for students to attend once they returned home from school uh, after the traditional school day. Right, that's not what I'm asking though. What I'm asking is what are we doing to ensure that students are able to attend after-school programming and access all those wonderful things that you just talked about uh, in their school of origin? Because unless we're placing after-school programs uh, in their shelters uh, or right next to their shelters, you know, that are that allow for the gap in time between them leaving school at the end of the school day and then getting home. So you whatever time they are allowing for that and then provide the services, you know, onward from that time until uh, mom and dad can um, can go pick them up after work at six or six thirty. Um, what what is the plan? This is a serious issue and this was a serious issue before the pandemic. And I mean, honestly, I didn't hear you acknowledge that this is a real problem about how youth are accessing, youth in temporary, in temporary housing are accessing after school programs. It's great that we're making it universally acceptable. It's universally acceptable for everybody but kids that are in shelter. I mean, look, we students in middle school um, often have um, Metro cards. There are other ways. We are um, not able to provide yellow busing um, at the end at, at six o'clock in, in the evening. And so we do work with our community based organizations um, to reduce barriers to provide other means of, of transportation. Um, I know that we also support family uh, Metro cards. And again, we by expanding the number of programs, we're making more um, local to where families live. So that idea that if a student does have to take the bus home after the traditional school day, there likely could still be options in their neighborhood, uh, either directly in their shelter or nearby. Do we have uh, any data on what percentage of students who are in a DHS shelter or a DHS and HRA shelter, any type of city shelter, 
um, what percentage of those students are engaging in after school programming um, and how that and how that compares to the general population. Yeah, we could um, be happy to work with our colleagues at the Department of Youth and Community Development to pull that data. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have that um, okay. uh, with me now. That would be interesting to see. Um, okay, I just have a couple more questions. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues. Um, actually, at this point, I'll turn it over to my colleagues and I'll, I'll circle back on, on a second round. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank, thank you, Chair Traeger and Chair Levin. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. We will be limiting council member questions and answers to five minutes. The Surgeon at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. I see that council member Salamanca has his hand raised. Council member Salamanca? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. How are you? Uh, how are you, commissioners? Uh, thank you for this uh, very important hearing. Um, I just have a few questions uh, regarding uh, transitional housing in communities of color. Uh, I know myself, uh, my colleagues, Diana Ayala, Vanessa Gibson, uh, you know, um, when Richie Torres was a council member, we're the council members in the borough of the Bronx that have the most transitional housing uh, in, in our communities. And we're actually housing um, more families out of, our out of our districts in our districts. Uh, I have a school in, in the West Farms area where over 50% of the students are in transitional housing. Um, so my question is schools that are housing a large percentage of students that are in transitional housing need extra resources. What extra resources are they getting compared to other schools that have very low transitional housing students? Thank you for your question, council member. Um, that is the reality of our situation that we do have schools that are, um, have much higher concentrations of students in temporary housing. And that's why we've taken a two pronged approach in this administration um, to make equity investments in those schools with the greatest concentrations and also support um, all schools um, with, with baseline supports. And I'd okay, like- so uh, I, I'm sorry, I have five minutes. What yeah. equity, I wanna know, tell me specifically what equity uh, uh, changes you're making in a school Absolutely. such as mine. Yeah, yeah so, so we are investing uh, social workers in those schools. We are investing um, community coordinators to connect with families and connect them to resources. And we're placing more family assistance in those shelters. Those are three concrete human capital investments that we're making in the schools with the highest numbers of uh, students experiencing homelessness. Okay. Um, one of, another issue that I have as I speak to my homeless families um, in transitional housing, one of their biggest challenges is that many of, they prefer that their children continue to attend the same school that they were in before they got into the homeless shelter system. And unfortunately, the way the system works uh, is that they, when a family goes into, a home, into the homeless shelter, DHS just sticks you in wherever there's an opening. So what is DHS actually doing to ensure that families entering the shelter system are staying in their communities? Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater, do you wanna take that? Please, my time is running. Can someone unmute Deputy Chancellor, uh, Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater, please? Thank you so much and apology for the technical issue. Uh, thank you for the question, council member. As you know, uh, chief priority of this administration and uh, uh, value under the mayor's turning the tide plan is opening shelter in every district um, across the city. So that way families do have the opportunity to be placed close to the anchors of their life, whether that be the school that their child is attending, a religious institution or friends and neighbors. Um, we have announced uh, 89 shelters, uh, 46 of which have been opened. Of that larger number which have been announced, 38 are to serve families with children populations. So when families come to us at intake, we do place them uh, in a conditional placement. Uh, this takes a host of considerations uh, into account. 
There might be a borough preclusion because of an instance of domestic violence, um, but we do make every effort to place the family close to the youngest child's school. Um, we did add recently a metric to the MMR. So you'll note in the MMR, there's actually two measures. There's the measure at initial placement, and then there's a point in time count, which is much higher. Uh, for March of this year, that number is 74%. I think what's important to include also in that is that, as has been mentioned, something that's important is family choice. Families do make decisions based on where they'd like to be placed. Um, they might be willing to travel to get their youngest child to school, but they want to prioritize an older child and making sure that that older child has an easier commute to their school. So okay. family choice is also important, but we do make every effort uh, to make those placements. And the capacity brought on through the Turning the Tide plan is really important to make sure that we have vacancies to place families accordingly. Okay, I have two very quick questions. How many students are in a transitional housing uh, setting that are enrolled in the public school system? Do you have that number off the top of your head? On any given night, there are about 13,000 um, students who reside in DHS. I'm expired. Okay. Um, and then my, my, my last uh, is, is, is a question statement, Mr. Chair, if possible. I, I saw- Yes, please, please, Councilor, since yeah. you lost time with the, with the delay, you have more time, please. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my, I, I heard um, that there was a question about Metro cards um, and there was a statement made that if, ch uh, if the child opts, the family opts uh, for the child to do remote learning, that they will not receive a Metro card, is that correct? Um, not that is not true for students in temporary housing. Okay, so students in temporary housing, even if they choose not to, uh, they, they choose remote learning, they still get a Metro card. Jody, can you confirm that please? Sorry, uh, can we unmute Jody Sam? Thank you, <laughs> yes. Yes, that's true. So students in temporary housing do still have access to Metro cards, even if they're um, learning remotely. Um, we wanted to make sure that they had access to the enrichment opportunities and to access free meals. Okay. Um, I, I just would have to say that I'm, I'm happy to hear that they still have access to Metro cards. I think every student, whether they're doing remote learning or not, they should still have access to a Metro card, whether they're in temporary housing or not. Um, one of the biggest challenges and talking to my parents uh, is the technology that they get with DOE, many times they need to be replaced or there needs to be troubleshooting. And families, uh, yes, they can call DOE, but it's very difficult to navigate that system. And so families decide or they choose to actually go to the physical school and the school helps to navigate. And if you are not providing them with a Metro card, you're just creating another barrier uh, and an excuse for them not to go to the school to get a new uh, piece of technology. Um, and with that, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the extra time. Thank you, Council Member Salamanca. This is a re reminder to Council Members, if you would like to ask questions of the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing that no other Council Members have their hand raised, I will turn it back to Chair Traeger. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, just to, I just wanna have a couple of just quick follow-ups. Um, uh, as mentioned, that uh, the latest data that the DOE shared with us, we have over 97,000, approximately 98,000 students in temporary housing total. Uh, and uh, how many at this moment social workers do we have assigned to students in temporary housing? Um, I think that's so. So, this is what I could say to that. Um, we have a hundred bridging the gap social workers, um, which you're very familiar with, are, are directly placed in schools, um, explicitly trained and put in schools with high numbers of students in temporary housing. However, that by no means represents the footprint of social workers who support students in temporary housing. As I mentioned in my testimony, almost every school in this system has students who are temporarily housed. When we think about our 300 community schools, all of which have mental health services and all of which have students in temporary housing, those supports are also benefiting um, our children experiencing homelessness. 
Um, so it's, you know, we could start with the 100 Bridging the Gap social workers, um, but really, you know, the social workers across the system are generally supporting um, students that are experiencing homelessness. Right, and, and, I, and I certainly understand that's why, you know, I look at just, if you do the ratio, 98,000 students, 100 Bridging the Gap social workers, that's one social worker for close to 1,000 students. Um, but I understand you mentioned that there's other supports, but do we have, does anyone really have an actual ratio number of how many so, uh, social workers to students in, in temporary housing? Does anyone kind of track that or have that? Well, I'm um, trying to find our total number of social workers in the system. Um, it's still very I'm much sure you know. Mr. Caruso, yes. Uh, and, and that's why, you know, I, I think some folks might have seen our budget response yeah. uh, where we are calling for a much more dramatic increase than what the administration proposed, even with, look, we welcome the 27 additional, you know, community schools and 150 or, or social workers, but we still need so much more. And there's really no, there's no excuse. Uh, at, we're at a point where we have to, we have to produce and we have to rise to the moment and meet, meet, the, meet the needs of our, of our children. I, I will say, Mr. Cruz, so that, um, you know, we, I, I'm a big believer, regardless of kids in temporary housing or not, but particularly kids who are facing trauma every day. Um, we need to get to a point where we have one social worker for every 150 students across, across the school system, particularly for kids um, who are certainly high needs. I, I also just want to say, uh, in addition to social workers, um, you know, one, one of our big priorities is making sure that we expand dramatically PSIL programming across across the city, particularly communities of color that, that don't have access to that. That also is another meaningful connection for a number of students. I wanna share with you, Mr. Caruso, also um, recently we, we had an announcement in my district about uh, a community school, PS 188 in Coney Island, where we're making a lot of investments for a lot of great things happening there. But some of, some of the feedback from students when they talked about um, what they uh, felt with their art, they have an art therapy program, which we support with counseling in schools. Um, the, the feedback from kids meant everything to me. And just to share with my colleagues in the public, I, just be, these, these, these little words mean so much. Um, students said they, 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 feel, they feel safe, they feel supported, um, they love art, um, they they want to go to school because of these of these wonderful programs and sessions. Um, they enjoy the quiet time. Um, these are things that some folks might take for granted, but they mean the world to our kids and to our school communities. It's making an impact in terms of attendance, uh, in terms of better supports. So to me, yes, social workers, counselors, but also art programs, music programs, the after school programs. We we need to. We need to significantly move the needle forward. We, yeah. it, we, this is something I'm just, just letting folks know that the councils are gonna go very hard on this issue um, and rightfully so. And I think that many folks in DOE will, will agree on the need to go very big and bold. Uh, last question I have, uh, last point I wanna, I wanna raise. In January, more than 30 organizations sent a letter asking the DOE to fill the vacant positions in the DOE's Office of Students in Temporary Housing that were on hold. Uh, we're glad that DOE then moved forward with filling several of these positions. However, we understand that there are still two important positions, Director of Policy and Intergovernmental Partnerships and Director of Capacity Building. Uh, why are these positions on hold at a time when students in shelter need all the support that they can get? And when does DOE plan to fill them? Yeah, we appreciate the recognition that a strong infrastructure is important to supporting children and families. Um, I think that just as an aside, one of the findings from the RAND study, when you talked earlier about the impact of community schools, was that there was a robust office um, centrally supporting the schools, ensuring that there's a level of consistency, common expectations, and support uh, across the system. And when we talk about our investments um, for um, students in temporary housing, um, and as, as I was saying to Council Member Salamanca, um, 
you know, the bulk of our human capital investment is the addition of social workers, community coordinators, uh, and family assistance. And in order for those 300 plus school and shelter based staff to be effective, we need a strong team of managers to coach them, to provide them feedback, to listen and train and onboard them. Um, and we're really grateful. We did have a number of vacancies in, in that role and we still have vacancies, but we have um, recently been authorized um, to fill these positions. Um, we just onboarded um, a, a new employee, new regional manager um, last week. We have another one starting another week, um, and we're confident that we're going to be able to fill these positions quickly. Uh, I can assure you that Mr. Hickey is hustling every day uh, to bring people uh, through the interview process. Um, you mentioned these two other additional positions. I would just say that um, one of those, our director of capacity building, became vacant a couple of weeks ago. Um, these are, um, have been, the, the people that have filled those roles have played um, critical roles on our team. As we go into the next fiscal year and look at what um, kind of the stimulus is going to offer and what the program offerings are, is this is going to be an opportunity for us to make sure that we have the staffing structure that best supports the work. And we're currently just assessing how we want to structure our team for greatest impact. So to be clear, we're expecting to fill these positions in in the near future, is that right? Well, I, I, I'm not sure that those are the exact positions we need, right? Those were positions that were filled um, several years ago. Um, folks did their work and we are like, the world is gonna change in the next uh, couple of weeks in terms of the funding. And we wanna make sure um, that we have um, the right staffing supports to support that. So I'm not going to commit right now to fill those exact positions, but we are actively hiring to make sure that our students and temporary housing team is as robust as possible uh, to serve our students and families. Right. I mean, the world likely will not change as far as the number of kids in temporary housing in our city. And I agree that we need adequate infrastructure to make sure that we are moving the needle forward here, but you need infrastructure, you need folks in these key positions. Um, and so- right. I'll, I'll give yeah. you an example, Terry, Terry. So like, for instance, we also just created a brand new role, right? Acknowledging all of our um, school social workers, we created a director of clinical services um, and are really happy that Rebecca Askew just took on this new role a couple of weeks ago. Um, so now that we have that capacity, like it's, you know, that's what a supervisor has to do. They have to look at the assets on their team and determine what the best um, kind of human capital decisions that need to be made are when they have vacancies. And so I prompt, I mean, you know that we've been committed and working hard to make sure that all of our positions are filled and that we're supporting our students and families and we will continue to do that. I'm just not ready to commit right now on like specific titles, um, as, you know, we're, we're not in a position to do that right now. I mean, just to kind of close out the point, this is similar to what I've been talking about with regards to kids with IEPs, that you need someone at the macro level, having a bird's eye view of things, making sure that services are being rendered, and parents know their rights, kids know their rights. This is a sizable student population, and we just can't deal with it sort of in piecemeal or in silos. And I, I really do think that these are critical things. And Chris, I do... I do acknowledge that you've been helpful in building out some of the infrastructure that we have in place right now, but I think that we, we still have more to do. I, I wanna share the one last thing. I mentioned before some of the students who shared about what the art, uh, uh, the art sessions meant, but one of the parents said, again, I, I wanna share, you know, these are real stories from real folks with families. My child has been talking about this upcoming uh, session, meaning the art session all morning in reference to the student dissipating his session later on in the day. Um, I think for me, the key word is connections, connection to our students. And in, in closing out with the administration here, um, one, of the, one of the advantages, and I, I, sh I should share this publicly, of the community schools initiative and that, and that incorporates all the key wraparounds, but also just enrichment and art, music and other critical programs and dealing with food insecurity, other things. Um, these connections mattered a lot during this period of time. Um, and that also includes, I wanna say for the record, not just community schools, but also learning to work LTW programs, which we're also gonna fight like hell to get not just restored, but even, even more money for. Um, these connections are really important. And it's, it's, you can't just overlook them 
and just go right straight to academic. Um, you know, I, I, I was a teacher. I, I, I know, you know, before you open up a notebook, there are so many things you have to establish in that classroom and in that school environment in the first place, um, where every kid feels safe, supported, you know, embraced, welcome, loved, um, housed, uh, nourished. Like, there's so many things that, that go into making education work. Um, and so, and I know that the community schools program and other programs that we're talking about here really make a cr critical difference. And I think that they are even more critical for kids in temporary housing who really rely on these key relationships to be great, you know, sources of stability um, and a sense that they have a great uh, social safety net that's around them to support them and to lift them up. So we need, we'll be going bigger and bolder, Mr. Caruso, and to uh, all folks, just letting you know, unapologetically going bigger and bolder. And uh, again, we, we thank you for your time and, and service here, and we wish you continued success in your career. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just, we just would like to make sure Council <laughs> Chair Levin doesn't have any more questions. I, I do actually, um, sorry, I have my two-year-old here, so bear with me. Um, so yes, I have a few questions uh, that I'd like to um, get to here. Um, I'd like to hear more about um, uh, the specific plans for students in shelter um, in the summer rising program. Um, is there going to be busing for that? Um, what is the shelter outreach plan? Has that been developed yet? And if so, what is it? Um, yeah, I could start and then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Jonas. And I, I just wanna kind of pick up on Chair Traeger's call to be bold in terms of reimagining what schools can be. And as the mayor announced on Tuesday, summer rising is the end of summer school as we have known it. This is a drastic reformation around what traditional summer school is um, and what it can be going forward. Removing this false choice that we've made families to make between enrolling their child in an academic program or enrolling them in a fun childcare program. It's really bringing those things together. And we know that our students in temporary housing are um, going to be able to benefit from this immensely. And Sarah's done an amazing job at helping to design this program. And Sarah, why don't you talk a little bit about the outreach and how uh, that'll work? Sure, so I think um, a key piece of the outreach for Summer Rising will be those trusting relationships with community-based organizations. So Summer Rising uh, you know, is really um, taking up the community school strategy and the values um, that, that, uh, that we've talked about here around that trust and that relationship and how important that is to engaging students and families in school, in learning and to connect with one another. And so a key piece of the outreach will be those relationships that the community-based organizations already hold with families and students and that they will be able to outreach to and connect those students and families to this amazing opportunity of summer rising and all of those enrichments and academic and social emotional supports uh, that the program will bring. Um, so that'll be a sort of a key piece of that connection uh, to the program. When you say community-based organizations, are you speaking about shelter shelter providers specifically? Um, so the Summer Rising program is going to, uh, will be partnering uh, schools with uh, community-based organizations and providers through the Department of Youth and Community Development. So many of these are providers that uh, support after-school programming throughout the school year and will be partnering with schools in the summer to provide uh, support. I, I, I hear that. What I'm, what I'm saying is that, so, so in particular, um, uh, families, shelter system, the family shelter system is, is largely not for profit based. So there's, you know, there's probably about uh, 30 or 40 providers um, that are not for profits that um, some of them may do um, uh, after school programming, some may not. Um, um, so they may or may not have relationships with DYCD. I don't know. Um, yeah. There, there's actually a, a, a significant amount of overlap there between CAMBA and Bronx Works and Sobro and those types of organizations. All the mm -hmm. summer rising programs are gonna be in yeah. schools. Chris, if a kid's lucky, they get to be placed at, at Bronx Works. They get a placement by Bronx Works or CAMBA or Henry Street or Wynn. If they're unlucky, they get a placement with at a hotel with, you know, with a skeletal crew and skeletal, skeletal services. Um, and um, unfortunately, a much too high percentage of children are getting placed in those types of circumstances. So I'm, what I'm concerned about is not the kids that win, 
who, you know, have access to, to these programs are not the kids at Henry Street. I'm worried about the kids that are placed with CSS uh, uh, or CCS, excuse me, CCS um, in a hotel like out on uh, North Conduit uh, that are not getting linked up. Um, so that's what I'm worried about. So if I could just jump in, um, this is a good opportunity to just point to uh, the commitment under turning the tide to and the use of clusters and commercial hotels. So in terms of your concern, council member, uh, we currently have approximately um, a little under uh, 1500 families uh, in commercial hotels and we continue our close down uh, to be able to transition those families to the high quality turning the tide sites that have been opened up. Um, I also want to point out uh, as of earlier this week, all uh, clients have exited CCS operated uh, locations. But I, that, that was just an example, but, but um, there are still a lot of um, uh, children. If there are 1500 families, um, then there are, you know, likely to be about uh, three to 5,000 at least children um, who, are, who are still in commercial hotels. I just want to make sure that there's an outreach program from Summer Rising directly to those providers that have contracts with DSS DHS. That's all. Yeah, ab absolutely. There, there will be a robust outreach effort, and we are opening more school buildings than we ever have before this summer to ensure that even that family on North Conduit will have a school building in Ozone Park that is accessible, mm -hmm. like that they will have the access nearby, um, uh, there will be programs in every neighborhood across the city and our combination of nonprofit partners, um, the DHS partners and our school system will be doing um, really active outreach um, to encourage and support families to apply. Um, can, uh, sorry, just changing topics here. Is there, um, is there a breakdown you spoke, you, um, Chair Traeger asked about, um, about students in temporary housing in general's um, in-person ver versus remote breakdown. Do you have a breakdown of students in shelter, um, specifically the, so the shelter population, subpopulation of students in temporary housing that, and the breakdown of, of whether they're remote or in-person? Um, let me check. Don't think I have that handy. Um, I apologize. You don't have it. That's fine. Can can you can you get it to us? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, how many students in temporary housing participated uh, have participated or are participating in um, in in learning bridges? I have the number of students from shelters that participated, sure. and that's uh, about one thousand seven hundred. Okay. Um, if it's possible to, to augment that with uh, uh, the broader um, uh, um, universe of students in temporary housing, that would be helpful. Sure, we can do that. Um, <clears throat> and then, I, and I think you've, you touched on this throughout the testimony, but um, if, if you could kind of enumerate for us the, um, uh, what you see as your priorities for the federal funding coming in, in terms of the, the use and how that would how that's going to address the needs of students in, in shelter and temporary housing. Yeah, I'm happy to reiterate that. I think that there is, is um, you know, the executive budget will be coming out shortly, and there's going to be an engagement process to really examine how we can best use the stimulus funds. So far, we've been made um, several investments. So one is the expansion of 27 new community schools in the neighborhoods by the pandemic. Um, two is the launch of Summer Rising, which we're really excited about. Um, we've also hired, announced hiring 150 new social workers uh, and screeners um, to do mental health screenings across the city. So kind of addressing the whole child and family and um, acknowledging the adverse child experiences that are a result of the pandemic are uh, among our top priorities um, with increased funding. Um, so seeing the time right now and, and, and knowing that we have um, members of the public that wish to testify, um, 
I'm going to follow up with questions in, in writing um, for you all. Um, but, um, but I think that that's it for me right now. Um, I mean, last thing I just want to reiterate to everybody, and I just want to, to uh, leave you with this in, in terms of how, how we think about this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working here from my home. I have a nice, decent sized apartment with multiple rooms. And so my wife was able to just take my two year old and go into a different room so that he's not on top of me while I'm doing this. And my daughter's able to do what she's doing. Um, and we all have some semblance of some space. Um, when you're in a hotel room trying to do this for a family of four or family of five in a single hotel room for 495 days, just think about what that's like and, and what that does to a child's social, emotional, intellectual growth. And, um, and so when we talk about all of these things, that's, these are the, there are thousands of children that are, I mean, if they're lucky, they get in, they get placed in, um, you know, with one of these tier two providers that we know and, um, and have longstanding relationships with. Um, but if they're not lucky, they're, you know, they're kind of on their own. The parents are on their own and they're stuck with this voucher that's not worth, you know, a damn. It's just, it's, it's, it's not, it's not useful. Um, and, and, and the sense of, of, you know, just um, isolation and desperation that can result from that is really traumatizing. And, um, and it's happening to thousands of kids. Um, and we're not talking about when we say temporary, temporary, you know, temporary housing, 495 days, think about that as temporary. You know, that's, that's almost, that's, you know, that's, that's more than half of my son's lifetime. So, yeah. Um, and, and council member, I think, um, just to reiterate, I think the concern is, is well understood. Um, we acknowledge that the commitment to end the use of commercial hotels for families is of the utmost importance. We continue to make progress on that. I mentioned the number of cases. Um, I think what's important that I just want to add to that is as of uh, February 28th, um, there were 987 school-aged children placed in commercial hotels. Um, so while there are individual impacts for each and every one of them that we want to work to avoid and prevent, um, those numbers do continue to come down. And our commitment to close those commercial hotels as the uh, temporary gap for our families, uh, we're well on our way. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of your time and testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levin. Seeing that no other council members have their hand raised, we will now turn it to public testimony. One more, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on after each panel has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to two minutes. Please wait for the surgeon to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Again, written testimony can, can be submitted to testimony at council.nyc.gov. The first panelist will be Randy Levine, from the Advocates for Children, Raisa Rodriguez from the Citizens Committee for Children, Leslie Armstrong from Volunteers of America, Diana Cruz from the Hispanic Federation, and Tammy Sams from Sanctuary for Families. We will first be handing from Randy Levine. Randy, you may begin when ready. After the thoughts now. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. 
My name is Randy Levine, and I'm the Policy Director of Advocates for Children of New York. I want to start by just expressing our appreciation for the work of all of the Department of Education folks who are here today. And in particular, just want to acknowledge the work of Chris Caruso and wish him well as he moves on from the Department of Education. Despite the hard work of many educators and DOE staff members, including the DOE Students in Temporary Housing Office, the pandemic has worsened the inequities that have long existed for students in shelter. Over the course of the pandemic, we've heard from families in shelter about students having to wait months to receive an iPad, students whose iPads did not work properly due to lack of Wi-Fi and adequate cellular reception in shelter units, students who had difficulty focusing on schoolwork while trying to complete assignments in small rooms that they shared with their parents and multiple siblings of varying ages, grade levels, and needs, and students whose instruction or special education services were not effective over a screen. We've already discussed attendance today in general, but it's even more concerning at the high school level. 10th graders in shelter in January had an attendance rate of just 64%, meaning they missed one. Randy, you are Randy. up a, a bit. And Randy I froze. Also, Randy, sorry. Sorry about that, Randy. And also, um, it's okay if you can if you can please slow down because we're um, doing some testing at the council, so you can take your time. Thank you. Thank you. We've already discussed attendance in general, but it's even more concerning at the high school level. 10th graders in shelter had an attendance rate of just 64%, meaning they missed one out of every three school days. We continue to call on the city to use attendance data to reach out to all families of students in shelter who are not currently engaging in school or have not been regularly engaging and identify and resolve the barriers that are keeping them from participating in school. Given the significant systemic roadblocks students in shelter faced during the pandemic, the city should keep the needs of students in shelter front and center as it decides how to use the billions of dollars of COVID-19 education relief funding it is receiving from the federal government. A number of the recommendations in the city council's response to the preliminary budget, such as summer programming, small group tutoring, evidence-based literacy curriculum, compensatory services for students with disabilities and social workers will be critical for students in shelter. But as we saw in the case of iPads, merely offering resources to all students or even saying that students in shelter have priority for resources is not sufficient to ensure students in shelter have meaningful access. Rather, to ensure students can access supports, the city needs an intentional targeted plan for students in shelter. For example, when it comes to the city's new summer rising program, and any other supplemental programming, such as tutoring that the city may offer next year, the city should conduct intensive strengths-based outreach to ensure families and shelter specifically know about the services and get support signing up, listen and respond to any concerns parents and shelter may have, and connect them with other professionals who can provide additional information as requested, provide door-to-door -door transportation for the summer and all services, including any that take place outside regular school hours, provide summer services and tutoring on site at shelters that have space available, and ensure there's a remote option with sufficient support for families, including IT support, language access, and accommodations for students with disabilities. Some of this intentional planning will require targeting resources specifically to students in shelter especially at a time when the DOE is receiving more than $6 billion in federal COVID-19 relief funding. As just one example, AFC has recommended that the DOE hire a core of professionals to focus on outreach and engagement, given the number of students in shelter who have not been regularly attending school, the DOE should include as part of this core, at least 150 shelter based community coordinators to focus specifically on helping students in shelter connect with school and access any supplemental programming services and supports the DOE will be offering. Quickly with respect to intro 150, we support this bill, which would establish a task force on transportation for students who are homeless. We have more information about our, in our written testimony about the improvements that the DOE has made to transportation for students in shelter, as well as some recommendations for strengthening the bill. 
And I want to just end by thanking the City Council and especially Chair Levin and Chair Traeger for the incredible leadership you have shown in standing up for students in shelter, drawing attention to their needs, and fighting for targeted resources such as bridging the gap social workers. We look forward to continuing to work with you to ensure that students in shelter can participate in school and get the academic and social emotional support they need after the disruption and devastation of the past year. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank, thank you, Randy. Next, we will be hearing from Raisa Rodriguez. Before we, I'm sorry, I, I do have a question for Randy. Um, um, so are you, as, as a kind of uh, along with, with Raisa, you know, two of the most established organizations that are advocating for students in temporary housing in the city, um, um, are you, um, is there, a, is there an, a, a, a structured engagement with the Department of Education on these issues, especially in light of the federal funding coming in to make sure that it's um, the resources are getting um, to students in temporary housing in the, in, the, in the way that's most effective? We're in regular communication with the Department of Education and definitely appreciate our partnership. That said, I think we're looking to see more from DOE leadership to ensure that for every announcement that comes out from the Department of Education about any new program support or service that's going to be offered from the federal funding, there is a specific plan to ensure that students in shelter have access and can benefit from it. So, you know, I gave summer as one example. And since that is the one that was announced this week, we want to hear more. We, we definitely appreciate the Summer Rising program. Um, we were excited to hear about it. And we wanna hear more about the specific, intentional, targeted, proactive outreach that's going to happen to ensure that students in shelter can sign up. But then also, how are they going to get there? Um, as you know, they are entitled to transportation to school and educational services. So what does the transportation plan look like? Will there be any, any summer rising programs that are on site at shelter for shelters that have space or that are nearby. Of course, to the extent students want to stay in their school programs for the summer, we want to ensure they can do that. Um, so we are concerned. As I mentioned, you know, we, we definitely appreciate that the DOE, as one example, prioritized giving iPads to students in shelter first. That was a great step and probably wouldn't have happened five years ago. So we acknowledge that is progress. Um, that said, we saw that that didn't mean that every student in shelter ended up with an iPad in their hand. And it certainly didn't mean that every student ended up with a working iPad. In fact, so many students ended up at the shelter. I think you're breaking up again, Randy. I finished. I'm not sure where you were. <laughs> I just got about cut the off. end. Okay. We, we, so yeah, again, I just, we greatly appreciate all the work you do, and um, you've been um, uh, as tenacious as anyone I know on on these issues. So uh, much appreciated, and and uh, we should be um, in uh, pretty constant contact about uh, in the in the coming months about um, uh, how these federal funds are going to be spent. Thank you, Randy. Sorry, Raisa. Thank you, Randy and Chair. And this is also a reminder to all other council members that if you would like to ask questions of the panel, just use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on the council members after the entire panel. I will now turn it to Raisa Rodriguez from the Citizens Committee for Children for testimony. Time starts now. Oh, Marisa, I think that we're having a hard time hearing you, but you're not, you're not muted. So I don't know why now you're muted though. Can't hear you. Marisa, we, we will come, we will start you right back to you. Um, How was that? Oh, there perfect. we go. We hear you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that all. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Raisa Rodriguez, Associate Executive Director for Policy and Advocacy at Citizens Committee for Children. 
Um, it is a tough act to follow when my colleague and partner Randy goes uh, before me, but I am so um, you know, glad to be able to echo so many of the priorities she outlined. Um, CCC is a multi-issue advocacy organization. Um, our work really aims at ensuring that all New York children are healthy, housed, educated, and safe. We are a lead organization um, in the Family Homelessness Coalition. Um, that's a, a diverse group of stakeholders, including shelter providers, advocates, um, and other um, stakeholders seeking to, to combat family homelessness. Um, our goals is to, are to prevent family homelessness, improve conditions in shelter when shelter is unavoidable, and expand affordable housing options. Um, even before COVID, the needs of students in temporary housing was a, and continues to be a key priority for the Family Homelessness Coalition. Um, what's at stake is even deeper inequity. We are really concerned about uh, the needs and the, the, the current year that students have had um, with abrupt school closures, inequitable remote learning. Um, now is the time to make bold investments. We wanna make sure that we call attention to the historic moment, if you will, with an unprecedented amount of resources coming to New York City. Now is the time to make really bold investments in making sure that the needs of students in temporary housing are met. Um, I don't have to go through the numbers. I think that our colleagues and partners at the Department of Education um, did a great job in outlining what their numbers look like. Um, I would caution that you know, any numbers during a, a, a or count during a, a unprecedented year of a lot of uncertainty um, is worrisome. Um, we know that on average citywide, we know that uh, about out of every 10 students in temporary housing uh, experience housing instability and in areas like the Bronx, that ratio is much higher. We call on the administration and um, the council to ensure that all students living in, in shelter have full access to programs and supports. Um, as Randy mentioned, we need to prioritize all resources and programming to these students. We wanna make sure that we increase capacity to meet their needs. We also call on the, the expansion of 150 community coordinators to really navigate the system. We heard a lot so much about um, the difficult time families have in navigating those systems. These roles can facilitate in that. And then lastly, if, I'll, if I have to end, I'll end at calling attention to the need for behavioral health supports. This is true even before COVID, but after the year that we've had, we need to make sure that students in temporary housing have access to social emotional supports that we know are critical to ongoing educational progress. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, and and uh, I'll, I'll have a follow-up question uh, for, for, for Reza as well. Um, uh, similar question that I asked Randy about just the level of engagement that you're having right now with DOE and um, um, you know making sure that they are they the, that any of the kind of gaps that might be that they might have in their planning are being kind of identified and, and that there's a, a feedback loop that's 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 uh, very quick and effective and reaching the right people at the right, right time. Sure, I have to um, give a shout out to Mike Hickey and his team. I know that they've done, uh, you know, as, as best as a job as possible at maintaining open lines of communication. We want to build on that, as Randy said, we want to make sure that, and I know that that's been part of the goal, so I don't want to suggest that that hasn't been the goal. Again, given the amount of resources, we want to make sure that we work together to not only use data to call attention to the need, but also to think creatively around how to support students who are hardest to reach. Um, so yes, we've been working and talking. Our goal is to continue to build on that. And, um, and they've been receptive to, to your uh, recommendations. And, and if there are areas where you wanna see uh, more resources go, they're, they're open to those or? We have to continue conversations around what, you know, plans and priorities with current level of resources. We haven't talked about the current budget, um, but we have had um, a lot of time sharing, you know, what we're hearing from providers and from the ground um, in terms of what challenges families and students are facing with remote learning, for instance. So they have been really welcoming of that type of information. Um, I think what's ahead of us is beginning to strategize again about leveraging resources um, and making meaningful investments. And just as a 
my pitch for both um, Advocates for Children and CCC is, um, you know, long before COVID, um, your two organizations have been advocating for the needs of students in temporary housing, whether that's transportation or after school, social emotional learning. Um, so um, I, um, you know, I thank you and I want you to, um, uh, I want to make sure that your voices are part of this um, conversation, especially as we're looking at an influx of federal funds. Thank you so much for the time. I submitted testimony. Um, and as part of that, there are um, write-ups and recommendations on how to enhance and improve intro 150, which we support. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you, Raisa. And, and if I could just ask one quick uh, follow-up uh, to both, uh, both uh, folks who I deeply respect and, and I, the council has greatly learned from uh, two stellar organizations, which we appreciate both of you. Um, we, we got data that uh, the majority of students in temporary housing have still, the families have still opted for full remote even now. Um, I have mentioned this before and I'll mention this again that you know there are some folks out there strictly focused on academics. To me, as a teacher, I'm focusing on how do we establish, reestablish connection because you can't get to academic if we can't connect with kids. We have to know where they are, that they're okay, that they're safe, supported. And, um, and so from just a question to, to, to both uh, Raisa and, and Randy, um, what do you believe based on things that you have heard, uh, things that you have seen um, are the remaining barriers to, to reconnect um, students in temporary housing? And what, what, can, what are some of the lessons learned now so we, we get kids enrolled in summer rising and certainly as we prepare for deepening connections in the fall? Do you want to go first, Raisa? Sure. So I think, you know, there's a lot of lessons learned. I think we've been pushing for certain you know, whether in person or remote, we need to make sure that we improve instruction um, and access to, to, to high quality teaching for students, whether they're remote or in person. Um, and so we're happy and, and encouraged by the progress made um, with internet services and devices, um, but we need to do more. It's not enough that, you know, we're making progress. Any child that can't log on appropriately is too high of a number, right? Um, and as we've mentioned in our testimony, you know, in terms of, of supports, we want to make sure that supports are available both on site, right? Every family is different, right? And I'm not going to, you know, claim like I know what everyone's um, situation is. They're, every family is different and situations are, are different. What we want to make sure is that there are ample opportunities to access um, educational supports, both on site and shelter. And when that's not available, that there is transportation, right? And that there are um, roles and, and like care coordinators, for instance, whose job is to promote so that if it's a matter of just information, that also is covered. So it's about outreach, it's about on-site support, and it's about supports to get kids to where they need to be if it's not going to be in shelter. I echo those points as well. And we'll say that we are so grateful for the council advocacy and for the DOE to launch the Bridging the Gap social worker program. Um, and so glad that we have 100 Bridging the Gap social workers in our schools and 100 students in temporary housing community coordinators in our schools as well. And think that their work has been important during this pandemic. Um, at the same time, we know that three out of every four students living in shelter attends a school that does not have a Bridging the Gap social worker or a community coordinator, um, just given the numbers of students in shelter. And so we do think that part of the next phase is looking at the on-site support at shelters. There are currently 117 Department of Education family assistants, but as we heard right now, about half of them are working remotely but even when they return, we have seen a huge increase in the number of students who are homeless, and we have not seen an increase in the number of family assistants, um, and also see a need to make sure that everyone in those roles is fully qualified and has the skill set needed. 
Um, and that's where this recommendation for using some of the federal money for 150 community coordinators based in shelters comes from that they combined with the family assistance can have more of an impact being on site to help students and families re-engage with summer programs and then with school in the fall. Um, and we think it's gonna be really important to listen to their concerns, to take a strengths-based approach, to figure out what the individual barriers are. I think the barriers are still varied. Um, as far as the attendance rate, I think technology is still a problem for some, low digital literacy, space, need for mental health support, we, we you know, other responsibilities. We think that there are still a number of barriers out there and that it's really going to take folks to, to connect with families on an individual basis, figure out what the barriers are and to resolve. Randy, you're breaking up again. As students return to school, having social emotional support there will be critical. So we're definitely um, appreciate the council's call for additional social workers. Um, as well as other mental, direct mental health support. Thank you, Randy and Risa. And I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on um, the need for more full-time social workers. I mean, I, I kind of go back to basics when I, I, much, I mentioned this numerous times, but just to summarize quickly, when I visited the, the, the community school, renewal schools, so to speak, whatever they, they called them at the time, but the, the school and, and um, International High School in Queens when they invested uh, in the full-time bilingual social worker um, that also spoke the language of the community that they were serving and how she right away identified the trauma that kids were, were experiencing with regards to the hostility towards immigrants from the previous federal administration and how she had to establish a safe space for them immediately because of the fear of encountering any authority figures. That was one of the, that was one of the biggest barriers, if not the biggest barrier to attendance in that school. Uh, and that bilingual social worker was able to immediately flag that and become a resource for the kids and for their families, which picked up after her hire, attendance picked up, and then soon afterwards, the scores began to pick up. So I agree with you that once we put these supports in place, we'll identify additional barriers that we have to overcome for our kids. I really appreciate both of you highlighting that. Um, are there any other, uh, Kalima, are there any other members that have questions for the, um, thank you, Chair. So as I said earlier, we will wait until the entire panel has gone. We still have a few more folks and then we will turn it to our to the council members to ask questions. So we have Leslie Armstrong, who, who is up next? I'll start now. Thank you. My name is Leslie Armstrong. I'm an assistant vice president for Volunteers America. Um, I oversee our New York City emergency and housing and shelter services. We are an anti-poverty organization that provides housing and support services to over 11,000 people every year. We operate four transitional family shelters that offer on-site services for our residents, as well as three confidentially located emergency shelters and scatter site safe houses for individuals and their children who have experienced domestic violence. Our staff has been an essential resource to our families as they manage the impact of COVID-19. Our team has been delivering DOE meals right to the doors each day. And our case managers have worked with DOE liaisons to ensure our youth have devices and internet connectivity to facilitate remote learning. Our families have experienced long waiting periods for their children to be incorporated into busing routes. One particular egregious case involves a youth who resides at our region family residence on the Upper West Side and relies on a wheelchair for mobility. He was unable to attend school for six weeks due to delays in assigning him a bus route. The proposed task force must review mechanisms for ensuring transportation is provided promptly for students in shelter with adequate accommodations for differently abled students. We have also observed the need to increase the number of buses and routes servicing our youth. There have been cases where students are scheduled for a 5 a.m. pickup to be dropped off at their schools at 8 a.m. Sleep deprivation resulting from early pickup time noticeably impacted how those students performed their classes in their classes. 
Our youth are often precluded from participation after school or summer programs because bus routes are unable to accommodate activities outside of regular school hours. We support the proposed legislation to require the creation of a task force Time. the transportation of homeless students. I would like to thank the Committee on Education and General Welfare for providing us with a platform to discuss the challenges that youth and shelters face in New York City. And we look forward to partnering with the City Council to address the needs of this population. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Leslie. We will now hear from Diana Cruz. I'm starts now. Thank you, Council Member and Committee Chair Traeger and all the other committee members for taking the time to listen to the testimony drafted by the Hispanic Federation. We're a nonprofit organization seeking to empower and advance Hispanic communities through programs and legislative advocacy. My name is Tidy Abreu. I'm sitting in for my colleague, Diana Cruz. I am the policy analyst for the Hispanic Federation. And yes, I'm here to advocate for youth in shelters across New York City, but particularly those coming from communities of color uh, struggling to face the challenges that COVID-19 has posed in their lives since the full shutdown of our schools last year. Black and brown students make up 94% of students living in shelters and are navigating a myriad of challenges beyond their unstable living situations due to disproportionate inequities affecting students of color in education systems. These challenges make it hard for students to engage in schoolwork, which leads to incomplete education goals. Uh, for example, high school graduation. In fact, only 45% of homeless youth graduate high school in four years. As school districts and the city receives funding to support education, it is imperative that students living in homeless shelters are provided the necessary resources to achieve their educational and career goals. To address this, the Hispanic Federation strongly urges the council and city leadership to include and prioritize the following recommendations. One, ensure access and continuation of technology, high quality internet, devices, and literacy trainings at homeless shelters. Two, increase culturally relevant and linguistically diverse mental health supports. Three, train shelter staff and or hire more education focused professionals to navigate education related issues and directly support the youth at homeless shelters. Four, pursue holistic approaches. Hi. Pursue holistic approaches to lead homeless youth to equitable post-secondary and career opportunities. And five, engage in a citywide initiative that addresses educational barriers for homeless youth, which includes housing, food, and financial insecurities in collaboration with the education department and community-based organizations who are experts in working with homeless youth. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Next, we will be hearing from Tammy Sands. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Tammy Sands. We can no longer hear you. Give us one moment. Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you perfectly. Awesome, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Tammy Sams, the children, the program director of Children and Family Services at Sanctuary for Families, New York State's largest provider of comprehensive services exclusively for survivors of domestic violence and their children. We are so grateful to the city council for the opportunity to testify today and to council member Levin for bringing this urgent discussion of school-aged youth in the shelter system to the council's attention. For almost 30 years, Sanctuary has run a large 58 family um, transitional center and four small crisis shelters that together provide residents for 350 to 400 adults and children annually including over 200 children last year. Sanctuary Shelter provides a safe, nurturing clinical and educational support system for, for school-aged youth with wraparound services, including individual and group counseling, after-school programs, 
one-to-one -one tutoring, a summer camp, and year-round youth and family recreational activities. You may be aware that domestic violence is the single largest driver of family homelessness in New York City, according to um, a two, 2019 NYC Controllers Report. Um, domestic violence accounts for over 40% of families entering the city's DHS shelters. At this hearing, um, as this hearing acknowledges, it's crucial that it's crucial to address the educational needs of ch children living in shelters, especially given the profound challenges of families um, have faced during the pandemic. Throughout the COVID public um, health crisis, Sanctuary's five shelters have remained operational and at capacity, rigorously following health and safety guidelines. And we quickly adapted our services to continue supporting shelter resident families disproportionately affected by the pandemic. For school-aged children specifically, Bye. our shelter staff have provided virtual counseling, frequent wellness checks with every family, virtual pro, uh, group program, including literacy, arts, physical movement activities, and academic support, including enrichment packets, school supplies, and extensive tutoring program. All families have received access to emergency food, clothing, and other basic needs. Sanctuary response and service continuity in the last year has been critical. Even before COVID, school-aged children of our shelters, as well as other shelters across the city, have faced an array of obstacles to healthy development and academic achievement, exasperated by the pandemic. Transportation issues, language and communication barriers, a steep digital divide, and difficulties with remote learning frequent moves between schools, attending underfunded schools, placement in a shelter located different borough from their school, and chronic absences are just some of the issues we've seen. These challenges are all compounded by the ongoing trauma of, pro of poverty, housing insecurity, structural racism, and experiencing violence. Transportation has been an issue for school-age youth in shelter, all of whom have the right to busing. Because school staff are often unfamiliar with mandated HRA protocols for these students and due to confidentiality concerns for students in domestic violence shelters, the process of arranging busing typically takes weeks. In the past, students were given metric cards to limit absences during the interim period. However, the process has become even more difficult during the pandemic. Families have not received metric cards in months and DOE officials in charge of serving school-aged children in domestic violence shelters have been unresponsive at times. These transportation issues are coupled with stark digital divide that leaves many students in shelter without adequate devices or reliable internet to attend classes, all contributing to the chronic absences for both in-person and remote learning. Recent DOE attendance data showed that in the month of January 2021, students in shelter missed more than um, any other group citywide. Youth in shelter who have experienced and witnessed abuse were always more susceptible to chronic absences as families um, <clears throat> adjust to new shelter and school environments. And as they begin to heal and adapt after um, enduring months of years, <laughs> months or years of abuse, um, heightened patterns of absences have hindered students' capacity to stay connected with their peers in an already isolating time and remain on track academically, particularly without robust support from DOE schools. Additionally, language and communication barriers have intensified our students and families in shelter, heavily impacting immigrant families, those who are monolingual or limited uh, English proficiency, those without adequate digital devices, and students with IEPs. Amid school closings and remote learning, often with schedules changing last minute, communication from the DOE has been almost entirely in English. As a result, families have missed important messages such as invitations to vital EEP meet IEP meetings. Um, in many cases, they are not able to get the information via phone, um, via email, despite often not having um, necessary technology or language capacity. In light of these heightened profound set of academic, social and emotional challenges for school-aged youth in shelter, further amplified for youth who have been exposed to family violence, Sanctuary urges the council to address enhanced communication from DOE schools and administrators 
including multilingual communication to families in at least several uh, major languages, increased availability of school officials by phone, better oversight regarding responsiveness to families with academic transportation and technology requests, and improved academic support for families struggling with remote school, um, schooling and for children with IEPs. We applaud Council Member Levin and the Joint General Welfare and Education Committee's oversight efforts um, through the two pieces of legislation being discussed today. Youth in the shelter system and their families are some of the most vulnerable members in our, of our community and those most impacted by the intersecting public health crisis of domestic violence and COVID-19. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for your continued work on behalf of marginalized youth, youth, abused survivors, and New Yorkers in need. Thank you so much, Tammy. And thank you for the good work you do. Thank you. This concludes that panel. This is a reminder for council members, if you have questions for this panel, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you. Seeing no hands raised, I will now call on our next and final panel. Olga Rodriguez from Vital Safe Horizon. Deborah Ber Berkman from NYLAG. Ted Houghton from Gateway Housing. Melissa Accomodo from the Brooklyn Defender Services and Kenneth Jones from the Salvadori Center. And first we will be hearing from Olga Rodriguez Vital from Safe Horizon. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, for some reason, I'm having a hard time getting on camera, so I apologize for that. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today before the Committee of Education and General Welfare. My name is Olga Rodriguez Vidal. I am the Vice President for Domestic Violence Shelters at Safe Horizon, the nation's largest nonprofit victim services organization. Safe Horizon offers a client centered, trauma informed response to 250,000 New Yorkers each year who have experienced violence or abuse. And we are increasingly using a lens of racial equity to guide our work with clients, with each other, and in developing the positions we hold. Safe Horizon operates six emergency uh, domestic violence shelters and one transitional shelter or tier two across New York City, providing 673 beds total. We will soon be opening a second tier two, uh, which will add 101 beds. Our confidential domestic violence shelters provide healing environments for families and individuals leaving a dangerous situation, an essential service for survivors of intimate partner violence. Families in DV shelter need help with clothing and with school supplies, including technology. Families in DV shelter need more services for students with needs around additional assistance. Uh, for example, tutoring, improvements to McKinney Vento and that IEP process. Residents are struggling with remote learning and with st striking a balance between work, their children's remote education and the many appointments they need to attend, for example, public benefits, housing, medical, and legal. We have also heard from clients about te technological issues. Some families have faced issues with connecting to remote learning, as not all of our shelters have been equipped with Wi-Fi, although Altis is uh, currently in the process of equipping our shelters with Wi-Fi access. We know this area the administration is working on, but it has been a hurdle for many shelter residents for the entirety of this pandemic. Families have also voiced issues with the learning devices provided to them by the DOE and needing to have these devices replaced more quickly. Additionally, families are frustrated by the disruption to in-person learning when a classroom or school must be shut down due to positive cases. The families in our shelters, including children, are dealing with so much disruption to their lives already. These changes from month to month, week to week, day to day are simply too much. Our shelters consistently run into issues with having children evaluated for additional support services and educational strategies, especially through CPSE. 
which is a very confusing system. Additionally, children who are supposed to receive related services such as PTOTST are not receiving them. There is a citywide lack of services for children who require additional support and families are left with adequate services, without adequate services. This is especially concerning and frustrating for the families in our DV shelters who are navigating so many systems as well as the traumas of violence, homelessness, and so much more. With respect to the two bills today's, on today's agenda, intro 139-2018 and intro 150-2018, we are generally in support of both. We support intro 139-2018, which will require the Department of Education to, to report to Student Health Services in correlation with student housing status for students in kindergarten through the eighth grade. By disaggregating data by student housing status, we will ideally be better equipped to identify unique or acute health challenges faced by students who reside in temporary housing. We also support intro 150-2018, which would establish a task force on transportation for students experience homelessness, as our families are still experiencing significant delays with establishing busing. The families coming into Safe Horizon shelters have experienced pain, trauma and violence at the hands of family members and loved ones. They are also living through the trauma of homelessness, racism, poverty, and now our collective trauma of COVID-19. To ensure the health, safety, and well-being of our families in shelter, including youth, the city must invest in both their short-term and long-term healing. That investment must include intentional and targeted plans to help students in shelter be able to participate and access any additional programming provided by the DOE, including tutoring, summer programming, mental health support, and services for students with disabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Deborah Brickman. Time starts now. I think they unmuted me first by mistake, if that helps you. Oh, okay, thank you. Chairs Levin and Traeger, council members and staff, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committees on education and general welfare on youth in shelter and in the school system. My name is Deborah Berkman and I'm a coordinating attorney for the Shelter Advocacy Initiative at NILAG, which is a free legal services provider. The Shelter Advocacy uh, Initiative provides legal services and advocacy to low-income people in and trying to access the shelter system and also advocates for those experiencing street homelessness. I like is grateful that you're examining the barriers to students living in shel the shelter system have in traveling to school. And we fully support intro number 150 as a necessary first step. Challenging getting children to school are constant for my clients who live in DHS shelter. Those problems present most often when clients have recently applied for shelter and are engaged in the initial application process. During that time, families experiencing homelessness are generally given a temporary 10-day stay at a location that serves as only a temporary shelter assignment. At that time, parents will have two options, either keep their children at their prior school or have them leave their prior school, often mid-semester, and enroll them in a new local school. It is rare for us to see DHS intentionally place a family near a school their child already attends. Rather, it appears that families are placed randomly and expected to figure out a way to get their child to school. Arranging a school bus can take weeks or even longer. And until such time that a school bus is provided, my clients are expected to get their children to school on public transportation, which can take hours in each direction. As a result, children are also often absent or late for school. And if they are absent or late too many times, a school may contact ACS and initiate a case of alleged educational neglect, which can endanger custody for my clients. Temporary placements are often assigned repeatedly as families experiencing homelessness are continually deemed ineligible for shelter. Prior to the pandemic, this happened daily to our clients who were required to apply again and again for months before DHS could verify their housing history. These successive temporary pl placements were not necessarily in the same location, resulting in further disruption to school placement and transportation and forcing families to repeatedly navigate each disruption or risk a case of educational neglect. It was often logistically impossible for parents to get their children to school at all, let alone on time. 
Since the pandemic, a temporary policy change has made it much more likely that temporary placements will be in the same place. But the problem will return when DHS reverts to its pre-COVID policy, which has, it has indicated it will do. Because of these substantial challenges families face getting their children to school, NILAG does enthusiastically support Intro 150 as a first step and hopes that it will lead to effective solutions to ease the burden of children in shelter traveling to school. Thank you for your important work on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Next, we will be hearing from Ted Hutton. Starting time. Hi, thank you for hearing, hearing from me. I'm Ted Houghton, from, president of Gateway Housing, a technical assistance provider that works with nonprofits and government to improve shelter uh, programs. Um, in 2018, Gateway Housing uh, launched Attendance Matters, a pilot initiative to improve the school attendance of children living in homeless shelters. This intervention was simple. It's just very much staged from the ground up on site at shelters. Funded by Robin Hood and J.P. Morgan Chase Foundations, it was a partnership with DHS and DOE, in, in particular the Office of Students in Temporary Housing, and four leading family shelter providers, Bronx Works, Help USA, Canva, and Win. It's not rocket science. We worked with DHS and DOE to improve access to up-to-date attendance data, we offered trainings on evidence-based practices, had advocates for children provide training on how to navigate the DOE system, and we hired an attendance coordinator to lead weekly meetings where DOE and shelter staff sat together and identified which students had poor attendance and developed service interventions to address familial and logistical challenges. Sometimes it was transportation or getting an IEP. Sometimes it was really intervening in a complex uh, social service intervention, but by just meeting every week to look at what the problems were, we really found that we could improve school attendance of children that needed it most. We made it clear to shelter staff that getting kids to school every day is a priority. We strengthened DOE's staff relationships with shelter staff on site, and we gave them the tools they need, and we achieved a measurable improvement in homeless children's school attendance. Attendance Matters has been independently evaluated and confirmed by researchers at Princeton, UPenn, and Marist universities. We'll have a report out soon. I'm the expired. Th the things we found out that were important were that DHS client care coordinators are essential. DOE community coordinators and family assistance really help. Transportation uh, task force would be great. Community schools are a good thing and installing Wi-Fi in family shelters is fundamental. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Melissa Accomando. Starting time. My name is Melissa Accomando, and I am a senior staff attorney in the education practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. BDS's education unit provides legal representation and informal advocacy to our school age clients and to parents of children in New York City schools. Many of the families we work with are experiencing homelessness or housing instability. BDS commends the city council for its attention to students in temporary housing. Problems experienced by students living in temporary housing have been particularly acute this year due to remote learning. Our office has worked with families living in shelters who waited months to receive remote learning devices, despite being a priority group. And even when families receive these devices, they struggle to participate due to the inability to log on. While we are pleased that the city is committed to installing Wi-Fi in all shelters housing school-aged children, many students living in temporary housing have lost over a year of school. The city must come up with a plan to provide compensatory education services to students who have missed so much school this year, including those living in temporary housing. Even without the added stress of a global pandemic, the process of entering shelter can be confusing and burdensome. Families who do not initially qualify for temporary housing may have to repeatedly return to DHS's PATH Intake Center and endure multiple provisional placements. The DHS COVID-19 rules that do not require school-aged children to attend PATH Intake and follow-up meetings should be made permanent. 
In addition, DHS and DOE must create a more streamlined process to ensure that sufficient space exists in the shelter system so that families are placed near their children's schools. When this is not possible, the process for requesting a transfer should be made clear. Finally, when families are placed far from their home schools, yellow bus service should be made available. Currently, many families are forced to choose between long commutes on public transportation or transferring schools. We have expanded upon many of these recommendations in our written testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this critically important topic. Thank you, Melissa. Next, we will hear from Kenneth Jones. Starting time. Hello, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Salvadori Center. Um, for those of you who don't know about the Salvadori Center, we are a push-in program K through 12 STEAM education, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, traditionally, we go into the public schools and we help schools achieve their STEAM goals. Um, you know, when I was first starting out in college, I wanted to be an architect and I actually um, got my license and practiced for a number of years. But as my master's thesis, I wrote a, a thesis on transitional housing for the homeless. And so the importance of providing a rehabilitative and supportive environment for the homeless is incredibly essential for the success of our students. One of the things we were very proud to do at the Salvadori Center was the last three years partner with the Department of Education to bring programs directly into the shelters to help students bolster their in-school education, have a sense of normalcy, and to engage each other through a collaborative project-based approach to learning grade level math and science. The really cool thing about the last couple of years is we've done some independent research that has shown that students who engage in hands-on and collaborative project-based learning that's tied to the communities in which they live, the buildings they enter, the bridges they cross, the parks they play in, that they get a greater sense of relevancy that of, for what they're learning in school. And what's really kind of cool is when the study showed that while they were in Salvadori, Salvadori the sense of rele relevance spiked, and it better, because if not, we'd be out of a job. But what was really interesting about the study is after participating in our approach, which is a collaborative project-based approach to learning, the sense of everything else they're learning in school, the relevance of that continued to increase and stopped declining. So it's very exciting. And I think what I really am here just to advocate for whatever you can do for the students in shelters, um, organizations like Salvadori will be there to have your back and to help you provide successful programming to the students. So thank you for all for what you're doing. If there's anything that we can do to help, please never hesitate to ask. Thank you. Thank you. This is a reminder to council members that if you would like to ask questions of this panel, please use Zoom raise hand function. It was, um, it was slightly. Seeing no hands raised, I will now, um, that, see no hands raised, that was the last panel. However, if we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to rep, would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in the order your hand is raised. Seeing none, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. I will now turn it back to Chair Traeger and Chair Levine for, Chair Levin for closing remarks. Chair Traeger? Uh, thank you very much, Kalima. And also, uh, I don't know if, if uh, Ms. Berkman from NILAG is still here or she, oh, yes. Uh, you, you had uh, mentioned with regards to uh, uh, ACS uh, referrals in, in, in cases uh, I had asked the question earlier of the DOE about steps that they're taking to make sure that we're not adding trauma to kids and families who are already experiencing enough trauma in their lives. And they had mentioned that they were taking certain steps, but I'm hearing from you that this is still an ongoing issue. Uh, can you just elaborate further on that? Sure. Well, so this happened more prior to remote schooling, because now it's a little bit easier for, for students to log on from home. So what I was speaking about is when people actually had to physically get their children to school, but a, a lot of my clients had this, this burden where they were not able to get their clients to school. They were not able to get their clients to school on uh, their children to school on time. And an ACS case was uh, 
is started. And after that happens, it's very difficult to, to get out of out of ACS's web. So it's very difficult and it's entirely not their fault. Yeah, that is not their fault. Uh, and uh, so so this was this issue that you were, that you were flagging prior, prior so, to this. Remote. Well, not only yeah. prior to it, but DHS has has indicated that it's going to go back to its pre-COVID policy of, well, first of all, I'm sorry, this supposes that kids will have to go back to school, right, in person, which I think they will have to go back at some point. DHS used to give successive 10-day placements when there was a, an ineligibility finding, and they wouldn't necessarily be in the same shelter. So now there's a policy that people can reapply from within shelter, so they're kept within the same shelter. So really, there's if there's problems getting to school, it shouldn't last more than a couple of months in the beginning. But when people are switching shelters every 10 days, it's much more difficult to get a, a, a transportation plan. It's, it's it, this this is this is this is a lot. Uh, this is a lot, and a lot of burden being placed on this family uh, that. Uh, no fault of their own already. Um, it, it just it just speaks to I think just the inadequate support structure uh, to help them uh, folks navigate this because the process should be seamless. We should not be adding any more headaches, trauma, problems, barriers to folks who are facing enough in their lives. And thank you for kind of crystallizing that point for us. And uh, we certainly appreciate. It. And just to kind of close out, and I'll turn over to my uh, co-chair, Chair Levin. Um, you know, from the start of, uh, of this pandemic and even before the pandemic, we always talked about um, making sure that our kids are safe, but also under a lens of equity. I, I, I go back uh, and remind folks that even when the city rolled out their, their rec center model, uh, that we had called for including students in temporary housing to be provided this critical access and service because many of them, again, rely on school to be a source of stability, the great equalizer that regardless of whatever's happening in their lives, that schools, it, it, the doors are open for them and the kids are loved, safe, supported, and so forth. So now that we're, we are in receipt of significant amount of, of resources from Washington, from Albany, um, we, we need to even further center that lens of equity to make sure that the kids that were, that were really shortchanged the most, the kids that were underserved the most, that they're front and center. Um, and uh, we will unapologetically be very big and bold in our budget response. We await the administration's executive budget proposal, but uh, the fight for school budgets, the fight for social workers, for art, music, after school programming, support structure, the coordinator, the critical coordinator positions, um, our kids deserve nothing less. They deserve a whole lot more. So thank you all for testifying advocates, colleagues, friends, Truly appreciate all of you. I'll turn it over to a great leader in the city on this effort for many, many years, uh, Chair Levin. Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger. I, I just want to thank the the, the, the last panel, um, uh, uh, Ms. Rodriguez Vidal, Ms. Berkman, uh, Mr. Houghton, Mr. Jones, uh, Ms. Uh, Accomando, um, for the work that you're all doing in trying to address this issue systemically. And um, and, and for your testimony and for being with us this afternoon. Um, uh, I just wanna once again, um, reiterate what a strong moral obligation that we have um, as a city government and as a network of uh, service providers, not-for-profit not providers and policymakers um, to, uh, to prioritize the needs of students in temporary housing. Um, when I say prioritize, I mean, put it um, front and center in, in everything that we do um, and make sure that um, as we're, as we're, um, we have a limited amount of, of time and, and uh, energy and bandwidth um, and, um, and we can never forget um, those children who are, um, who are really need um, the resources that we have at our disposal, um, and uh, we can we can do a lot better. Um, and I just you know I, I know that there's been a significant effort, and I want to thank um, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Crusoe. I want to wish him well. 
Um, I want to thank the entire um, UE staff um, uh, for the work that you do and the work that you continue to do day in and day out. It's not easy work. That said, um, we have to do better and we have to, um, and we, we, we can't just um, throw up our hands and say that these are intractable problems because they're not intractable problems. They're, um, they're, uh, there are issues that that we can address with the right policy solutions and resources and focus and effort and um and and we shouldn't we shouldn't be um uh stopping our work until until we're um until every child is having uh an equitable uh education as any other child in new york city so with that um uh, I wish you all well. Uh, I wish you all a good weekend, and I thank you very much for your time here today. I'll turn back over to Mark. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Trelevin. Yes, we, we have a lot more work to do, and time is of the essence because this is time our kids will never get back. I'm always mindful of that, you know, how whenever folks in government talk about, you know, the plan ahead, you know, you're only four years old once, you're only five years old once, you don't get this time back. And so um, uh, this is, we need to act with a sense of urgency. And uh, thank you all for, for being here today. Thank also to our great city council staff, uh, committee staff, my staff, council 11 staff. Thank you all for helping make this possible here today as well. And this hearing uh, is adjourned. <laughs>